you get the YouTube started? I got it. We should be live everywhere. Alright, I'm hitting the intro. Here we go. Let's go. Unidentifiable flying object. The UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Fighting the UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It can only be one thing. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of UFO No, the show that separates science fact from science fiction. This is your break from the propaganda, the bad news, the treasonous politicians, and it's time to get elevated with me, dude named Ben Stoner from the LCV Hell's Canyon, and I am in the stratosphere, baby, and it's clear skies with me for another episode. So glad to have him. It's the man. The myth, the legend, it's George with a G. What's up, bruh? What's up, aliens and earthlings? Brother Ben here at the UFO No Podcast. We take a lighthearted look at the universe's biggest mysteries. And if aliens are tuning in, we promise not to probe too deeply (laughs) into their sense of humor unless they ask for it. Because it's all about consent, right, Ben? (laughs) Well, I mean, I don't know what their culture's like. I would imagine they're fairly promiscuous with how they abduct people and play with their booty holes. But that is yet to be seen, and that is partly what we cover in this show, is the whole idea of anal probing and all that stuff. I mean, we like to ask the hard questions, right? The hard questions. How deep are they going? How big are the probes? Is there perforation involved? Do we need to be worried? Can we fall in love? You know, is it like the blind? Mike situation, Stockholm syndrome, alien probing. He didn't like it. Now he does, and we can't get him back. You know, it is what it is. But uh, yes, man, I'm very, very excited to uh, have you on another episode, my friend. And uh, this episode is going to be a doozy because we are going to be talking about um, the whole idea of, well, one is a very specific case called the Andover Poltergeist case, which is kind of a hidden gem of paranormal encounters because it's got a bunch of different details as far as like spooky stuff that the family went through as well as uh, what they would consider credible witnesses. That's something that we talk about a lot in this show is what is credible? What makes someone credible? And the loosey-goosey term credible in ufology of like, they've never lied to me before and it's the first time I talk to them is uh, is too loose for me. I, I think you have to establish credibility. And just because you're in your 60s and you're wearing a moo-moo and you've never lied to someone uh, or an investigator before doesn't mean uh, you're not prone to the exaggerations. You know what I mean? And the misidentifications and all that good stuff. So that's what we like to do. We like to go over these cases and pinpoint, well, is it what is presented uh, at face value? Or is there something deeper below the surface, layers, if you will, that we can poke at and prod at, probe, uh, to see if maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's more of a terrestrial concept to it, something going on. Maybe it's more paranormal. Maybe it's more supernatural. But we like to blur the lines over here at UFO No Show. So anyways, but uh, we're very happy to have you all here. Thank you for joining. Like, subscribe. You know how to do it. You're doing it all over the place for your favorite shows. Just extend that our way please 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 we are a value for value podcast which means time talent or treasure we don't like ads we don't like sponsors we like you and we like uh, for you to get involved and that's what we're asking to do so um but we got a great show we're going to go over the andover poltergeist case as well as we are going to look at uh a monkey pox outbreak that is headed our way we're going to go over some of that uh and what i consider some extreme fuckery going on with all that 
that. Uh, we're going to talk about how our slave numbers have been stolen. We're going to talk about alien bacteria and a, uh, a new study that has come out saying no aliens? What? Uh, and then we're going to also talk about how... Um, there's a whole bunch of people claiming that UAP, uh, the no-no word for me, uh, is better term than UFO because it's removing stigma and it's furthering the the uh, the uh, the movement because we're changing terms. And I completely disagree. And we're going to go over that. And then also we're going to go into Tim Burchett's now love affair with the fucking mummies that I just cannot shake off my ass uh, to save my life. Every time I say, you know what, this is probably the last time I'm going to talk about these goddamn mummies, they fucking pull me back in again because Tim Burchett's got a hard on for the fucking mummy. So we're going to talk about all that shit, uh, but we got a great show coming, so stick around. That's going to come towards the later half as well as we have our first admiral induction it happened last week i was unprepared for it i didn't have a ceremony ready because these are first uh but uh, we're gonna have a big old well little ceremony for our good friend thor for becoming admiral uh so anyway stick around we got a great show but let's get into um our first topic which is the andover poltergeist case are you familiar with this one at all um george i sure am and this oh. case was inspiration for the Conjuring movie series. This one did? Conjuring 2. 1 and 2? I believe it was more so 2, but they used some of the lore from this, uh, I guess, this case to... I think the they story. blended several. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious because I thought it was a different case, but now you got me wondering. Uh, real life experiences of the Perrin family who lived in a farmhouse in Burrowville, Rhode Island, 1970s family claimed to experience paranormal activities such as moving objects. Oh, very interesting. So yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, I, I would imagine what they did cause you know, what they're talking about in the conjuring is, uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Uh, they were famous paranormal investigators at the time, and there was this whole idea that they were kind of maybe potentially manipulating certain situations uh, to get certain results out of these things that uh, that leaned more towards supernatural and paranormal than maybe they were. There's, I mean, I'm not really sure what to think about all that because I do highlight a lot of fuckery and people that make claims about supernatural and paranormal and the like so you know it's easy to say that oh well they just made it all up because there's not enough proof but you know as we know about a lot of phenomenon is there's not a lot of proof and i i want to want to clear this up real quick just to just to get this out of the way because i i get a lot of people that are, seem to be confused about where i stand on phenomenon, whether it exists or not. I've been I've been called a debunker. I've been called all these things. Not that I give a fuck what anybody thinks or says, but I just want to make it clear that it's not that I don't believe in any of these things, okay? The whole idea is I want to believe. My pursuit is the pursuit of evidence that convinces me of that it does exist. And what is it? It is whatever it is, supernatural, paranormal, I don't care what it is, ghosts, goblins, leprechauns, unicorns, uh, you know, whatever. I, I'm, I'm very curious about all of this stuff, and I want to believe because it is incredibly compelling. Um, and just because I say that I don't believe Grush, and I don't believe Elizondo, and I don't believe Greer, and I don't believe any of these talking heads of ufology does not mean I don't believe in aliens. Let's just get this right. I, you know, I absolutely believe in the possibility of aliens. I think there's far too much space out there for it, for there not to be aliens. My, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, not believing that aliens are out there in, in the universe somewhere is like taking a spoonful of water and saying that sharks don't exist because there's none in your spoon. And I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe that. We've, 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 we've scanned a, a fraction a minuscule amount of our universe. 
you know, observable. So we have no idea what's out there. Where I draw the line, like I confronted Bassett on, is I draw the line of people that state for a fact that aliens exist, for a fact the government's got craft locked up. All of that, we don't know. It's all speculation. And anybody that tells you they do know is lying or selling something. And that's where I draw the line. Is it that? I don't draw the line in speculation. I don't draw the line in imagining. You know, I love hearing people's claims. But when people start stating for a fact this is the way it is, now, then I start to get skeptical. And I go, well, what led you to that? What evidence pointed you to that? And then they, like Bassett did, they reference everyone else who stated what their beliefs are as being the evidence. And that's not evidence. Anyways, got to get that out. But that's a big thing. I get people that say, you know, like one of the comments from the Bassett interview was, oh, so God, you can't prove God, so that means that UFOs don't exist? And I was like, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the whole thing about believe everybody and having faith that Grush is telling the truth without without evidence, that is, that is what I'm talking about. So anyways... I just had to get that little disclaimer out because I don't like it. I, I like, I, I love the idea of aliens and I'm not trying to squash anybody's belief in anything. I don't, I don't, that's not what this is about at all. It's not about calling bullshit or not, except for when I see it. But otherwise, like talk, the way we talk about aliens and stuff like that, like that's the fun of it. That's the fun of it. So anyways, I just had to get that out there. Uh, so, uh, so let's get back into it. I apologize, but it's just been bugging me. Okay. It's been bugging me. So I had to confront it. <sighs> okay. So anyway, so, um, the Andover poltergeist case. So all of this starts, um, out of, oh wait, do it. Do we finish the whole Lorraine and, uh, Ed, uh, uh, Warren thing? Do we, yeah, I believe that? so. I, I, okay. I think you were, uh, taught about a- how they may have like, manipulated some of the situations for sensationalism and there is you know there's compelling evidence on both sides there's compelling evidence Mm -hmm. that there were some of these cases that were legit and there's compelling evidence that they were manipulating certain situations so who knows for real but that they're they are somewhat of a controversial couple when it comes to that what it looks to me regarding the whole like what inspired the conjuring is it looks like it's a hodgepodge of uh, various, you know, like some of the different cases we've gone over plus this one. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and this might very well be, is that this is the Andrews family. So this is a different family. The one family that they're talking about that inspired the first conjuring was the Perrin family. So, but, it, but I would imagine that they combined several aspects of both to make it a little bit more, uh, give it a little bit more variety, I would imagine. So, uh, anyway, so, um, so all started out of nowhere, April 1974. Andrew's family had been living in their council house in Andover, Hampshire. And I actually have a couple of pictures to kind of show you what this beautiful little town looks like. Um, So they lived there for five years. Nothing unusual happened while they were there. The house itself was a decade old, built by the local council in the early 1960s uh, to provide housing for folks commuting to London. So there wasn't exactly a long, uh, you know, scary history to the place. It seemed to be pretty boring until this family moved in. The family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews and their six Kids, dude, they got after it. Uh, Maria, who was 20, Teresa, 12, Kevin, 19, Gary, 17, and Stephen, 15, and the youngest, Mark, who was 10. By the time paranormal investigator Colvin first met them on April 28th, the weird stuff had been going on for over two weeks, and every family member had experienced it. Um, and uh, Barry Colvin is the guy who investigated this at the time that it was going on. Apparently he was involved during some of these times when the actual events took place. Um, So it all kicked off when Teresa and Maria first noticed tapping sounds while they were in bed on Friday, April 12th. 
and the noise seemed to be coming from the wall next door. So naturally, they assumed it was just the neighbor making sounds. But um, when Teresa was um, barely whispering, started asking questions using uh, knock once for yes, twice for no system, they actually got accurate answers, which would be creepy. Creepy. Have you ever had an experience like that? Have you ever had a paranormal, supernatural, like I don't mean alien, but I mean like something like that? Yeah, when I was, uh, let's see, I, I had one when I was younger. And, you know, when I was a kid, your imagination kind of gets the best of you, right? Sure. So it kind of runs wild. And, yeah, I mean, it, growing up in the 80s, I uh, watched a lot of horror movies like Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Friday the 13th, The Exorcist. Classics, right? classics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, those will do it to you. <laughs> for sure i've never had a paranormal normal supernatural anything i mean the the closest thing i can say is uh when i was a kid we were moving to a new town and my parents were looking at houses and me and my sister were along with them and we went to this one house and it was kind of like a townhouse style you know like uh taller than it was uh wide and it was kind of long so anyway, so we go in there and there was this attic area and there was all this crayon, like, dude, literally every square inch of the, you know, typical attic roof, you know, ceiling when you're in the attic, it's, it's peaks like that, you know? So it was kind of small and, uh, you know, short as in, and dude, every square inch of that place, it was just stark white. It was like plain drywall was, was written, drawn on in crayon. And there was all these weird, and it was all writing, little pictures, um, weird little sayings. Like, dude, covered. The walls were covered. And uh, so me and my sister got a really weird feeling. And uh, we told my parents that we didn't like the place and we didn't want to move there. And I don't know if that's why they didn't move there, but they chose not to move there. I doubt it was that. Uh, there was probably other factors. But... Um, it was just a very, very weird vibe, dude. It was a creepy, creepy vibe in that attic. Creepy. So I can only imagine living in a place. But, you know, again, you know, looking back at what they've said so far is here for five years, they lived in this place. You know, you're talking about um, eight people all together that uh, nothing weird has happened. And then out of nowhere, weird stuff starts happening. So... Um, it seems odd, but anyways, uh, so April 12th, she's knocking, gets some answers and the exchanges became a nightly occurrence. So they're doing this back and forth, trying to do the knock thing, communicate with whatever's there every night. And for a while, the girls, I guess the girls were the ones that were kind of doing this. Uh, they kept it a secret, didn't tell anybody, and they were enjoying this, having fun with it. But eventually, they ended up telling the rest of the family what was going on, and soon everyone was asking questions to the wall, doing this knock, no-knock thing. Um, here's what I'll say. I'm very curious as far as like if if there's something like that going on, I might attempt to see if it is actually responding to me. But what weirds me out about this family is as a family, as a family, they are engaged in, they don't know what this is. They don't know if it's a neighbor. They're assuming it's a neighbor, but why the fuck would a neighbor do this in the middle of the night, all the, like, why? why? For what reason? And they never met the neighbor. And then the whole family gets involved to me is very, very odd. It's very mm. odd because you would think that someone, anyone along the course of doing this would figure it's really fucking weird. And how come they've never seen any neighbors? You know, and why mm. don't they meet them? Why are they just knocking? Why? You know what I mean? Doesn't it seem odd to you? 
Yeah, it does. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about how this is kind of a quaint, sleepy town and, you know, it, it seems conservative, like not really much to do in terms of excitement. So, sure. yeah, maybe maybe if it was the, you know, maybe they were getting shits and giggles, <laughs> just kind of fucking with with these people in the house. But you say there were no neighbors or 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 whatever they didn't meet. Right. I mean, well, because, again, they assumed it was the neighbors. They, it says hmm. right off the bat, they hear this knocking, and they assumed it was the neighbors making the sounds. So by assuming it's the neighbors, I'm going to say maybe they did meet the neighbors, but you would think that at some point if they knew the neighbors, they would they would bring up this knocking game that they're playing with the neighbors, and the neighbors would be like, uh, we're not knocking, and then the family would be like, wait a minute, what? You know what I mean? But, like, to be playing a game, and I don't know. It doesn't say they were hanging out with the neighbors every Thursday, and then they started this. It just says that they assumed it was the neighbors. So, logically, like, speaking, if they were hanging out with the neighbors, you would think this knocking game routine going on every night would come up as in, like, ha, ah, this is really funny that we're playing this game, and then the neighbors go, we're not playing a game, you know, but no, instead, they assume it's the neighbors, and I assume they're not hanging out with the neighbors because the neighbors are never acknowledging that they're doing this. You and know here's I mean? the thing, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Where were the knocking sounds located in relation to the house? Did it, did it happen in the kids' room? Well, For let's see. It says at first... Um, let's see. Let me think. Let me look, see if it's... Uh, if it says like where they were doing this, oh, I found. I found oh, it, it said here. that it's they were coming from the wall next door. So, I mean, it doesn't say what room. Here it is. Yeah, the two girls explained that light tapping sounds were first heard when they lay quietly in bed on Good Friday, April April twelfth. Um. It, and apparently, uh, they thought that the sounds were made by someone next door. Yeah. Especially, especially since the tapping sounds always emanated from the wall at Teresa's bed. Oh, okay. So it was in yeah. the it was in the girls' bedroom then. Girls' bedroom. Yeah. Okay. All right. So girls' bedroom, they're doing this game, which again they're assuming is the the neighbors. But by assuming it's the neighbors, that means I'm. I'm assuming that that means they've never got confirmation that it's the neighbors, meaning they've never met the neighbors. And I'm going to mm -hmm. guess it's one of those situations where there were no neighbors. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And I don't know if it's a duplex situation. I don't, the, so far from what I can see, there's not enough information about the house itself, but maybe Maybe it goes into it a little bit more later on, but I'm not sure. But either way, again, I'm assuming they don't know who the neighbors are because uh, they assumed it's the neighbors. They are that no confirmation. And again, natural conversation. If you're playing a game with the neighbors, it's going to come up. Ha ha ha. Could you imagine those answers you were giving me? What were you talking about? You know what I mean? Like anything dropping literally anything. It would make sense if you're playing a game. Why would you just keep that? It, it makes no sense to me to not bring it up at some point. So again, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm digging real deep into probably a, a, a who gives a shit detail, but to me, everything, all details matter. Exactly. We yeah. got to rule out all prosaic yeah, explanations exactly. and get this, get this, Ben, you know, when it comes to the knocking on the yeah. wall and, you know, ha it happening in Teresa's bedroom. Yes. It also says here that in order for the knocking sounds to be used, the family found that it was essential for Teresa to lie on the bed in order oh, to engage. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. If they stood up, the knocking would would cease. See, that again, like, to me, that is like, if there is a ritual involved in, in, in producing the knock, that means no. That means this is, this is a setup of some kind. It wants me to put my child on the bed to do this. I'm not doing it anymore. Like, mm -hmm. how irresponsible as a parent 
these fucking idiots. I mean, it's 1970, these dopes. You know, so I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't think like us now. With where where we have serial killers every ten square miles, it seems like you know. But I mean, still, how fucking retarded can you be to be like, oh, Teresa, the phantom knock won't start until you lay on the bed. So just lay on the bed, Teresa, so we can talk to the ghost. Like what the fuck? And we're just gonna assume it's Gary from next door, even though we have no idea. So right away, these people are stupid. I'm going to say that right off the bat. They are fucking <laughs> retarded. Because that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, oh, it it makes my... How old is Teresa again? She's 12. Make my 12-year-old daughter lay on a bed as a, as a trigger for talking to whatever the fuck. You know? And, and what kind of conversations were you having that was so entertaining that you're knocking on a wall as a family for entertainment. How sad. I feel so sad for these children. What are these people, Amish? What in the fuck? Dude, it's wild. It's wild to me. This is this is crazy already. We haven't even gotten started, and already I'm against these parents. You know, I would immediately call, if I found this out, I'd be like, so wait a minute. So, so let me get this straight. You're talking to a phantom thing. And then what kind of questions? Let's get into it. See what kind of questions they're asking. But so far, I don't like these parents. Not a, not a fan. They seem very stupid to me. Uh, so at first, they were, uh, family was keeping it simple. Yes or no questions. Three knocks, meaning I don't know. But then after, you know, a little while, they got more creative. They developed a more complicated system where the entity would knock a certain number of times to spell out letters. One knock for A, two for B, three for C, so on and so forth. Dude, that is long, really long. Because when it, what happens when you go to do a Z? <laughs> you know, what are you going to knock 27 times? Isn't it 27 or 25 or whatever the number is of how many... Letters are in the alphabet. I don't remember. It's been a while Sounds since I was in middle school. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. what happened to Morse code? Anyway, so um, this way they established that they could ask more complex questions, get more detailed answers. So, while most of the questions were still on the lighthearted side, like who would win an upcoming football game, the fact that these knocks had no clear explanation started to bother Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Oh, thank Christ. Thank Christ. So finally they get hip to the groove like this isn't natural. You know, like Jesus. How, how could you think it was? I just can't imagine. Maybe it's just, maybe I'm too paranoid. But please, like somebody else out there, let me know. Like, does that seem natural if you heard Knox, Phantom Knox coming from a wall that seemed to be coming from next door and you were just kind of nonchalantly communicating with a phantom knock in your house triggered by your 12 year old daughter laying on a bed. Like how weird is that dude? Anyways. Um, so they started to notice something else. Oh, like you had said, if Teresa wasn't sitting on the bed, the knocking wouldn't start. Um, then, uh, still Teresa and Maria continued their regular chats with this, whatever it was. And, but it started to claim, or wait, was it the kids? So it says here that the girls, Teresa and Maria, continued their regular chats with this thing, who claimed his name was Eric mm. Waters. So at this point, it has named itself Eric Waters, and these two idiot girls want to keep talking to it? Good Lord, dude, for real, for sure, they are homeschooled, for sure. <laughs> and I can say that because I was homeschooled, and I know I was a fucking moron, so I get it. Uh, but not only did Eric say what his name was, he started to, dude, give out betting tips to the husband, Mr. Andrews, and even predicting accurately 
that Liverpool would win the FA Cup and uh, Leeds, which is L-E-E-D-S, uh, United would take the league, which is, uh, you know, look, I'm not even going to bother getting into that. I'm just going to say it's British football, and you can make that whatever the fuck you want as far as FA Cup and Leeds go. I don't follow any of that shit. I have no idea. But anyways, either way, it predicted the ending of the game. It helped out Mr. Andrews with some betting who clearly had a gambling problem. It's all coming together. You know, it's all coming together. The dad's in deep, right? The mom is clearly crazy with granola. And then the kids are by default crazy because all they taught is Mormonism. And so now here they are knocking the phantom Eric Waters and he's giving dad betting tips. So, of course, they're all friendly. Of course they are. No wonder this happened for two weeks. Because dad's like, I got the golden goose. Quit, keep talking to Waters, dude. Teresa, lay on the bed. I need to win this one. <laughs> so now I get it. Now I get it. So, so now it starts to escalate because I would imagine dad got greedy. You know, dad's like, no, no, no. One more time. One more time. Eric's a good guy. I promise. Um, the family reaches out. So after it escalates... Family reaches out to various people for help, including the police, a local priest, and a medium from a spiritualist church. Now, the medium said that uh, Eric was the spirit of a boy buried under the floorboards of the house. Oh, that fuck that, Noah. <laughs> and what that he wanted fuck? to take over Teresa's personality. Dude, he's a trans. So how weird is that? Phantom trans. A trans ghost? Dude, dude. <laughs> trans medium. Nah. Oh, shit. So he's like, I want to be Teresa. It's like the worst. Uh, what was that movie? Uh, Single white female. Where the chick, the roommate goes all crazy and like takes the girl's identity and tries to have sex with her boyfriend and everything and super creepy. It's like that. Except with a ghost. It's Patrick Swayze just trying to be a girl. So around 8.15 p.m. on April 19th, this is when this uh, investigator, Barry uh, Colvin, uh, ends up uh, getting a call from... Mr. Andrews, and he says, uh, again, tells Colvin basically what's been happening, that they noticed this knocking, um, then it would stop when someone new entered the room, it was like only for the family or whatever, um, and he said that he wanted Colvin, the investigator, to quietly sneak up the stairs and observe what was going on in the room from the outside as in to not disturb what was going on so he could actually observe it. Because again, anyone else that came in the room, it was, uh, it was, it would stop. So they couldn't have, the, they ghost, couldn't... the ghost got shy around new people. There you go. That's right. Stage <laughs> fright from the ghost. So, um, that's what he did. He ended up going up there moving slowly, getting carefully up to the door, near the doorway. And from his spot that he took, um, he couldn't hear exactly like what the questions and the responses were, but he could clearly see that no one in the room was making the noises, the knocking noises, you know, as in no, Ooh. none of the girls were making the noises. So, he gets a little bit closer to the doorway, and just outside of it, uh, Mr. Andrews notices uh, and asks Eric if it was all right for Barry to come into the room. And mm -hmm. the answer, a single loud bang for yes. So uh, uh, Colvin comes in the room uh, with this entity eric's permission and so as soon as the investigator steps in the room heads over to the headboard for uh, of Teresa's bed and from there he could tell that the knocking sounds were coming from the middle of the wall 
directly opposite the girl's bed. So basically right in the smack in the middle, right in line with the girl's bed. And Mm. he notices that something else, that when Eric answers the questions, especially the more complicated ones, where he had to knock out the letters of the alphabet, the last knock was always louder, like noticeably louder. And almost like a period at the end of a sentence, like ending that sentence, making it known. For Uh, emphasis. For emphasis. Well, like basically what they say is signaling that that was the final knock in the statement. So Colvin leans over, puts his hands on the wall to, you know, sense, because obviously if you knock on the wall, you're going to feel it if you have your hand up against the wall. So... When this happened and it, it, he heard the knocking, he also felt the vibrations from the knock, meaning it was a physical knock, not just a noise. And mm. after about 15 minutes, Mrs. Andrews suggested that they wrap everything up for the night um, and, you know, get away from the thing for the for the evening. And in response, they heard Eric... Uh, give a soft but clear single tap, as in yes. And then the adults go downstairs. Mr. Andrews asks Colvin what he thinks is going on, and Colvin starts explaining his thoughts on poltergeist activity as a whole. And if if you're aware of, like, poltergeist activity, generally that's, like, physical manifestations of a haunting if I'm not mistaken. So there's different aspects. You know, there's like a general haunting, which is like you can kind of feel a presence, maybe temperatures changing, things like that. But I believe a poltergeist is where there is physical uh, effects from something, whatever it is, some kind of entity. Um, So... He again, he's explaining the poltergeist activity and he doesn't think he says that he doesn't think the knocks are coming from a boy named Eric. Instead, Colvin suggests it's more likely that there's some unknown energy that's possibly linked to the unique psychological dynamics of the household. So as opposed to being one individual. But it is interesting that where did it come up with the name Eric? Uh, what was it again? Eric. Uh, I can't remember. Eric. Eric. Uh, what was it again? Waters. Eric Waters. 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 Yep. Um, so Colvin leaves that night. Um, oh, oh, wait, wait. Before he leaves, he, you know, the family are not experts on poltergeists. So they were they wanted to hear what Colvin had to say about it because clearly Colvin did know about it. Um, and so Colvin suggests that they try moving the knocking sounds away from the wall, somewhere else in the room, or even somewhere else in the house. And he says that he believes this would help rule out the possibility that someone was pulling a prank from next door, mm. right? So... You know, this is like apparently, according to uh, to Colvin, this was a trick that he, that had been pulled in similar cases of this knocking happening, but it turned out to be somebody fucking with them. So Colvin leaves that evening. They agree that they're going to meet again soon, carry out the plan to move the knocking somewhere else, and hopefully figure out what's really happening. So the next uh, afternoon, or I think it was a little while later, actually. It was like a couple of weeks later. It was in May. Uh, Colvin comes back to the Andrews house on May 2nd, ready to move the investigation forward, explains the plan, which included trying to shift the knocking away from the wall that was connected to the house next door. Um, He noticed that the, you know, on top of everything else, that the reply seemed to be clear when Mrs. Andrews asked the questions versus anyone else. And because of this, Colvin said that she should be the one to communicate with Eric during these tests to try and get it um, elsewhere. 
So one of the um, key questions that they planned on asking was for Eric to make his presence known in a different part of the room. And once they set up in the bedroom, they decided to ask Eric to knock his responses on the headboard of Teresa's bed. So Teresa gets on the bed, sitting uh, a little distance from the headboard and the room. Everybody gets real quiet. Mrs. Andrews says, Eric, are you there? And they all wait. And it's just silence. Everybody's kind of tense. And after a few seconds, instead of a knock, a deliberate scratching sound came from the wall right above Teresa's headboard. And the scratching was steady and lasted about 10 seconds, which think about like a scratching noise on the wall for 10 whole seconds. That's a long time. That's a long time to hear a scratching noise. Um, So Mrs. Andrews asked the question again, but this time no response. So they sit there. Everybody's quiet for around 20 minutes waiting for something to happen. Eventually, Teresa suggests that maybe Eric left, but as soon as she said it, a response came, a loud double knock echoed from the wall. And after a moment, Mrs. Andrews asked again if Eric was there. And sure enough, clear knock. Again, same wall. So they followed up with several more questions all answered with the usual knocks. Then Mrs. Andrews asks Eric if he could knock on the headboard instead, and he said that he could. So she asked again, and this time there was a tap from the headboard. So Colvin, now super curious about what is actually going on, Colvin places his hand on the headboard as Mrs. Andrews asks again for Eric to knock on it, and this time... The knock was even louder, and Colvin could clearly feel the vibration on the headboard. So now it moved from the wall to the actual headboard. So they repeated this a few more times, each knock getting a little bit louder, and having successfully gotten Eric to knock on something other than the wall, they decided to push their luck. Hmm. Ah which is tends to be what happens when you play with fire. So they ask him to knock somewhere different again. And again, to their amazement, when Mrs. Andrews asked Eric to knock on the metal part of the bed frame this time, he did exactly that. And Colvin noted that the sound was distinctly different from the knocks on the wall and the headboard with a much higher pitch, which is understandable considering it's metal. But what is fascinating is the fact that it seems to be from a non-physical entity, according to the report. But yet, the knock itself is mimicking what would be a physical interaction with the metal. So that's really fascinating. So like, because to me, like, it's more than just knocking. It says, to me, it says, well... It wouldn't be a high pitch knock if it was like a fist, if it was a hand, if it was, you know what I'm saying? Something flesh, something, somebody touching it. It wouldn't be a high pitch knock, which says to me, it is a object that it's using, which is scarier. To me, that's scarier. So it's like an ethereal hammer that this thing is using to knock on the bed. I don't know, but it's just weird to me that like, it's clearly not a, a knuckle knock. It is like a, an object knock, which is really, really weird. Um, so they continue these experiments with Colvin and everybody for about 20 minutes before noticing that the knocks now, instead of getting louder, were starting to get softer, almost as if Eric was running out of steam. So Hmm. maybe coincidentally, maybe not. I don't really believe in coincidences, but according to the report, Mrs. Andrews mentions to Teresa, who's also looking tired, 
which wasn't surprising considering she wasn't sleeping very good and all that, but may she connect she suggested maybe a connection with that. So after the experiments, Colvin felt convinced that he was dealing with a genuine poltergeist case. So he leaves the Andrews house, go over his notes back home, clear his head, figure out what's going on. Three days later, figures he's going to check back in. So two days later, May 4th, Mr. Andrews reaches out to Colvin again, and he describes an intense session with Eric where things, according to Mr. Andrews, took a darker turn. From what he explained, Eric seemed to get angry and frustrated, and this frustration was loud. In fact, it was so loud that the neighbors and people passing by would stop outside the house to see what was going on. So it's clearly audible to everyone outside, which is, again, very, very fascinating. Was it intentional that Eric was trying, or uh, Eric was responding to these questions from uh from kevin well was kevin trying to like antagonize eric or get him pissed off or upset i don't think so i think what from what the report says obviously i don't know like what their tones were i don't uh, none of that i have no idea because we have no tapes about it or nothing like that but just going based off the report it seems to me that what they were doing is they were simply just like kind of just toying with this thing, just repetitive, repetitive, not can answer questions, not can answer questions over and over and over again. And so maybe it could be, you know, I mean, if I'm a thing that's trying to communicate, Let's say I'm trying to communicate an important message, Mm -hmm. but all I can do is answer your questions, right? But I, I, I need to get a message out. And all you're doing is asking me stupid ass questions. What's your favorite color? Can you move over here? What about over there? You know what I mean? Like I'd get real pissed if I'm like, look, I'm trying to give daddy over here some more, you know, hot tips on betting. So get the fuck out of the way, Teresa. I don't know. I don't know. Like what, you know, that all that is speculation. I have no idea. Um, but I, I could imagine that being the case, or it could be the case that it was just, I mean, look, we talk a lot about energy, right? Mm -hmm. So think about it as like fishing. Think of the knock as a fishing lure, and it's just knocking to kind of see what's out there. And then sure as shit, some dumbass family starts to interact. And now as one, two, three more family members get involved, the energy being devoted to this feeding into this is not getting it more frustrated. They're making it out as though it's frustrated because it's getting louder, but maybe it's not more frustrated. Maybe it's more powerful and they're not looking at it as that they're looking at it as, Oh, loud knock. It must be angry. It's not angry. I mean, I don't know, but it could be that it's just getting more powerful and maybe, yeah, go ahead. Wasn't that, wasn't that Kevin's initial theory that this necessarily wasn't a poltergeist per se, but it was the Some effect of the unknown energy? Yeah, exactly. Energy of the family or inhabitants of the house. Exactly. Something to yeah, do yeah, with yeah. the energy of the family. Yep. Clearly they're weird. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that plays a part. Um, who knows what else is going on that we don't know about um, within the family, not saying anything bad, but there always seems to be other shit. You know, when this stuff comes out, it always seems to be like, oh, the mom was cheating or, oh, the dad was abusive or, oh, the daughter was uh, getting fisted in the basement or, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's what I mean. It's like there always seems to be something else hidden in there that the family doesn't want to acknowledge 
to the investigator. You know, it's like if somebody goes to the doctor and they don't want to admit they have something wrong with them. So what are they going to do? They're going to exclude that from telling the doctor what's up. And then eventually, through enough investigation, the doctor just finds out what's going on. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I imagine. So in my opinion, I think instead of frustration, what I'm acknowledging, what I think is going on, is that it has actually latched itself onto this girl, Teresa, hence why she's the one, and also the mom. So there's a connection between the mother and the daughter that it's now using. So it's using the energy from the daughter, the communication from the mom to like continue this, whatever it is that's going on. And I think that it got more powerful, but then as Teresa got weaker, it started to get weaker. Maybe. I mean, again, that's my mm. preliminary kind of idea of what's going on so far. Um, so, um, where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Colvin's telling, you know, the, uh, I'm sorry, the dad is telling Colvin what's going on. Again, he thinks it's frustrated. Um, the neighbors are, you know, starting to hear shit. So, Colvin, first thing the next morning, heads over to their house. Mr. An or Mrs. Andrews tells him everything that's going on. And according to Eric, the again, the, the poltergeist in the wall, his skeletal remains were buried under the house. And he desperately wanted someone to dig them up so they could be given to uh, or given a proper burial. And apparently, again, according to the reports, things got even weirder when Kevin uh, decided to try communicating with Eric directly as soon as. As he started asking questions, the knocking stopped completely. So he tries a few more times. Eric stays silent. So Kevin switched up tactics. He declares that he didn't even believe in Eric. He says, Eric, you're a piece of shit. You're not even real. You're a knockoff imaginary friend. And that got a response. One single loud bang. So Kevin... Now, like, oh, I got a response. Keeps taunting this entity known as Eric, saying he doesn't think Eric's real, and another bang. Ke Kevin pushes even further, accusing Eric of being a liar. And then there's a small silence and then a series of loud bangs, one after another, as if, you know, Eric's really pissed now. So... These sharp, intense knocks from the latest, you know, interrogate or uh, uh, antagonizing by Kevin continue for several seconds before pausing and then starting up again. This continued on for an hour. An hour. This thing is just knocking. Um, and Eric, who's the, you know, again, the one knocking, is responding in bursts. Uh Though he's still answering some of the family's questions, he's doing it in like large bursts. So now it's it's even more kind of leaning towards what Mr. Andrews thought, which was that this thing is angry and frustrated, especially after Kevin's antagonizing of it. Um, so eventually, morning comes. They, they've gone all night doing this. Morning comes. Dawn is breaking. Knocking is stopped. Family's completely drained mentally and physically. Um, after they recount all this to Colvin, Mrs. Andrews asks if he could find someone who could remove Eric from their house. And so remember, mm. when we were talking about Kevin, Kevin was the kid. So Kevin was the other son. Which who who wasn't named before? So that whole previous thing that we went over of the knocking getting stronger and all that shit and being frustrated—that was Kevin, one of the sons that tried to communicate with this, not Colvin, just in case there was any confusion. So Colvin's the investigator. Kevin's one of the sons. Eric doesn't like Kevin. Now they want him out of the house. So Colvin is talking to the family and could hear Teresa and Kevin again, the children trying to talk to Eric again. And at first, there's no response. But then, Kevin, the son, 
resorts to his usual tactic of taunt, uh, taunting, calling Eric a, a bloody great liar. Because remember, they're in Britain. Uh, the you know the, they're limeys. So uh, a moment later, loud knock again. The adults rush in the bedroom. Kevin continues to provoke Eric, triggering again another series of intense knocks. And Mrs. Andrews, getting freaked out, leaves the room. Colvin, not afraid, enters the room, approaches the bed, notices that the knocking seems to be coming from the headboard, puts his hands on it again, and could clearly feel the vibrations from the knocks. So this continued on, all this activity. Man, this family is really pushing their their limits here. I mean, really, really, really. Uh, So they continue this for several weeks. They continue on doing this. Um, Although, over time, it seemed to be a little bit more controlled. The intensity that Kevin got them all riled up, um, you know, seemed to uh, ramp up when Kevin would go crazy, you know, start taunting him again. But again, it was more controlled. They could kind of control the the, uh, energy of this. So the family also notices that what seemed to be some kind of telepathic connection between Teresa and this entity known as Eric, Mm -hmm. Teresa thought of a number kind of testing this idea of, of it, if it, there was a telepathic connection. So Teresa thinks of a number asks Eric to answer it, you know, via Knox and almost every time he got it right. Almost every time. And when Colvin, when the family told Colvin about this, the investigator, Colvin wanted to do a series of tests to see if they could replicate it. So on May 23rd, Colvin comes back over to the house, ready to try out the new experiment. He brings over 40 cards, four sets, numbered 1 through 10. And... Teresa takes her usual spot on the bed. Colvin randomly picks a card, shows it to everyone without saying the number out loud, then holds it up facing the wall. And he asks Eric what number was on the card. The first card, that, which was a four, and Eric responded with four knocks. So Eric got most of the numbers right. He missed four out of the 27 that they ended up doing. But still, that's wild. Those are some pretty good odds. That is wild. I would call that a successful experiment. I mean, that's that's wild. Uh, So Eric says, with the high success rate, it convinces Colvin that the knocks could not possibly be coming from someone on the other side of the wall. Uh, and again, keep in mind, it's the 1970s, so the idea that there would be cameras in the house, because that was something I kind of thought of, is like, well, what about surveillance? What if somebody is surveilling the room? But the likelihood of of someone in 1970 uh, putting cameras up to play a prank or freak out a family is, is highly, highly unlikely. Um, and there's no reason, in my opinion, because I, you know, that you could say that the government probably had technology to do something like that, but why would the why would the government pretend to be a poltergeist in a family's home? You know what I mean? Like to me, that makes that that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> so I I I don't think that. Uh, so anyways, so um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Let's see. Oh, here we so go. The- yeah, I got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. All right. Uh, so after the test, family asks Eric various questions, mostly about himself and his family. He answered most of them. Um, there were a few where he knocked three times, saying, you know, the indication that he didn't know. Um, one of the most uh, intriguing moments, according to the reports, was when Colvin asked if he could capture Eric on camera. And Eric said yes. And it was agreed 
that during Colvin's next visit, they were going to try and do just that and capture Eric on camera. So Colvin comes back June 7th, this time bringing along Dr. Reinhardt Schaffauer, a senior scientist from the Egham Research Laboratories, with the goal to capture Eric on camera, capture an image of Eric definitively. So they set up all the necessary equipment, the family, along with the investigators, all gather in one room, which was the bedroom. And the communication starts up the way they always do. A few knocks, you know, starting out with easy questions. Um, and this time, conversation was friendly. One of the interesting moments, again, according to the report, was when Eric responded no when asked mm. if Teresa needed to be in the room to communicate with him. Mm -hmm. So they next, they moved on to trying to capture Eric with a picture. So they asked him where they should put the camera to get the best shot. And during this, Colvin had a thought that he wondered if Eric could see what they were doing. And so almost immediately, a single knock came as if Eric was saying yes, that he could see what they were doing. So although Eric was cooperative, uh, you know, telling them that they should aim the camera at the wall above the headboard, uh, none of the photos revealed anything. No figures, no presence, no, ad, uh, uh, what, what's the apparitions? Nothing. nothing. Um, but what they did get, is uh, some of their equipment picked up a full sentence from Eric uh, that was volunteered by Eric without prompting like they it usually needed. And the, the sentence was, I am here to rest and stop my bones from rotting. Creepy. They took a picture of a sentence? No, no. <laughs> No, I think wait, wait, I, I don't. I didn't understand that. No, what they were doing is they tried to capture an image. They didn't catch anything because yeah. again, they were photographing the wall above the headboard. But okay. what they did catch in audio equipment. Oh, audio! I believe audio. now it doesn't okay. say audio equipment, but because it was a full sentence, I'm assuming that's what they mean. But maybe not. Maybe it was a sentence written in the image. I don't know, but all it says, well, you know what it is because the way it reads, it says that the equipment did pick up a full sentence from Eric. It read, I am here to rest and stop my bones from rotting. So you could interpret that as it read as though the image, the text appeared in the image instead of Eric. So you might be right. You might be right that it was actually a visible uh, sentence instead of audio. Because it, it says it read as opposed to it said. You know what I mean? Or Eric yeah, said or whatever. Wasn't too clear on that. If they I mean, got it, it on they're not real clear on whether they captured it on audio or whether the image was actually uh -huh. presented over a picture. But the way you say it and, and looking over it again... Um, it almost suggests as though through these photos, they found this sentence. So I think maybe you're right. Um, mm -hmm. So then Col Colvin also noticed that Eric started to anticipate questions, almost as if he could read Mrs. Andrews' mind, just as he had done with Colvin earlier when he wondered if Eric could see him. So three days later, June 10th, Colvin returns for what would be his final visit to the Andrews home. And by this point, it seemed Eric was uh, becoming less responsive. Sometimes didn't respond at all. Um, but at 730, when Colvin got there, he had several questions um, from different family members that they asked Eric that got no reaction whatsoever. Then, Teresa said that Eric had gone and that he was gone forever. And she explained how she knew because, or that she didn't know, she didn't know how she knew, she just sensed it. 
So again, acknowledging that there was definitely a connection between uh, Teresa and this thing, Eric, whatever it was. Um, Even though supposedly Eric's bones were buried underneath the floorboard of the house. Mm -hmm. I mean, did they address that? Did they look under the floorboard? But supposedly well, the bones are still there, right? But the, the, the entity. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I, I, the fact that that originally that was his original case, you know, point is that I'm here to keep my bones from rotting. What it seems to be is it seems to be that no one, I, I mean, look, we'll keep going through it, but it doesn't seem like anyone ever looked under the house. Uh, so the report kind of goes back to when Colvin first met the Andrews family uh, and how he met them as he was reading about their experiences in a local newspaper. And he noticed that they were hesitant to share some of the details of what they were going for or going through. And, you know, to him, it, it meant that they might've been, you know, because they didn't fully understand why he was so interested in their case, you know, so they weren't giving up all the details to Colvin when he first met him. Um, what's interesting and something that Colvin points to about their credibility is he says that the family wanted to keep the case unpublished after the investigation wrapped up. And he says, Colvin says that that speaks volumes about the authenticity and credibility of their claims. And I say, well, maybe, mm -hmm. but maybe it's also because regardless of the credibility and the authentic nature of it, that there was no proof. There was no proof. And by them coming forward, what are they going to gain from that? You know, now you could say it was the trauma. You could say that. You could say it was, it was you know, which which does, I, I agree, the fact that they are traumatized by the situation does seem to be authentic emotional response to what they were going through. But the simple fact that they didn't want it published, there could be a number of reasons for that. There could be a number of reasons. Like, they don't want anybody looking at the family that hard. You know, that maybe Colvin heard and saw a few things that he wasn't supposed to. And maybe this whole thing was kind of manipulated and hence why they wanted it, Colvin out. It was done. All of a sudden, it's done because they don't want to investigate it anymore. Maybe there was certain answers that Eric gave or someone gave or something gave that shined a little bit too much light on the family. You know, I don't know. But to me to just say that, oh, they didn't want to publish, so therefore that means they're credible and authentic, I'm like, I think there could be more to it than that. I think there could yeah, absolutely be more to it than that. You know, that is quite a leap, you know, yeah. like he was suggesting that the family had no ulterior motives for yeah. uh, capitalizing on this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, there's got to be more. Well, I mean, you know, he points to the fact that, yeah, they that none of the family members seem to be out for financial gain or fame, um, you know, that that they would have been eager to spill details had that been the case. Um, mm -hmm. But again, they could be smart as stupid. You know, look, I mean, the family seems really dumb to me if this is an authentic case of an authentic entity. The fact that they would spend so much time playing with this fucking thing without knowing what it is is straight up retarded. Uh, but if you put it in the light of that they were manipulating the situation to... Again, there's only two people who were ever able to effectively communicate with this, mm -hmm. you know, or, well, that and the sun, but nobody else. You know, there was a couple of things, and it was a physical knock. It wasn't like a phantom knock. So it could very well be that they were able to find a way 
whether it be through the basement, maybe some piping, I don't know, that they were able to actually, again, there's no voices that we know of, only knocking. That's that's pretty easy to manipulate and and uh, and man, uh, manufacture. So, you know, simple knocking and even that spelling out shit, like literal just simple ABCs. Like, dude, that takes nothing. I mean, you could have a total dumbass in the basement that's able to do that. You know, you could have Helen Keller in the basement able to do that. You know, so... All what I'm about saying, the card yeah. reading thing? The, the, the psychic card reading thing where they were testing its ability to see... Well, again, reading. Teresa and the mother are both in the room. So if they were already able to manipulate it with the whole you know, talking and knocking. I mean, they could have easily been able to manipulate it where maybe Teresa and her mother were able to get information to whatever it was. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that it seems odd to me that it's just done. It's just done. They just, for one, they they never, I mean, to not go investigating where the bones are. I mean, again, look, we can look through this. They never... You know, they never investigated what that meant. Mm -hmm. You know, what it says is um, that after this case was wrapped up, um, the family seemed genuinely happy and that while the incidents might have been entertaining at first, they weren't exactly welcome and otherwise peaceful in an orderly home. And after all the encounters, especially with Eric's uh, disappearance, um, he felt that the family was truthful about the activity and that they weren't behind it in any way. But again, they never investigated. And so when when they asked when when you know asked Colvin about this case, was asked if he believed, uh, or I'm sorry, when he asked the family if they believed if Eric was a real person whose remains were buried under the house, the family agreed that he was and thought his remains might eventually be discovered. Colvin, though, he didn't think that there were any remains under the Andrews house, and he believed that Eric wasn't a ghost or even a person who existed, but rather some other unknown manifestation of energy. And... Colvin even went as far as to try and track down whoever Eric Waters was, ties to the area, anything like that, consulted with a local historian. Um, Waters was a common name in the area, but there were no records of any Eric Waters going back all the way to the late 17th century. So it's unlikely that there were. But again... (laughs) <laughs> there was never an investigation into the remains. That would be the first thing I would do. If a phantom knock told me there were bones in my floorboards, dude, those floorboards would be pulled up. And I'd know for a fact if there were bones in my floorboards. So that's another very red flag for me. You know, one is the investigation just wraps up very cleanly with no answers and everybody's just hunky-dory about it. Um, It starts out of nowhere and everybody's just entertaining this. That's very, very weird. So there's a lot of several red flags for me uh, on this. But there was something, uh, an interesting uh, discovery made uh, from talking with a gentleman named Mr. Smallbones, who was of the, the drove. yes, of the what of the drove and Dover, something about a caravan site, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, what he what it says is, uh, this Mr. Smallbones was the former owner of the land where the mm-hmm. Andrews house was, and when they talked to him, or when uh, when uh, uh, Colvin did. Uh, he mentioned, Mr. Smallbones did, that from the end of World War II to 1960, so from 1945 to 1960, 15 years, 
The land was used as a, as you said, caravan site, attracting numerous people from the traveling community. And if Eric Waters had been a part of this traveling community, it could explain why there was no official records because he was basically Mm. passing through. It says here that it was a caravan site that was a waste ground used occasionally by traveling gypsies. Ah. Uh. And apparently, apparently, um, while there's no evidence of anything weird happening on the land during the time as the caravan site that was there, um, there was a murder that took place around 1890 at Drunken Tree Drove, which was not far from the Andrews property. And apparently the victim was hung from a tree but there's no record of his name. And since the person was hanged, it's likely that the remains were never buried or were buried in a graveyard rather than being left on the land. So um, while the murder did happen, uh, it's probably not Eric Waters or we'll never know if it is or not. But there's also two other possibilities that, that Colvin mentions And they're a bit of a stretch, I'll give you that. Uh, But according to the local register of births and deaths, starting from 1837, two children were registered to parents with the last name Waters. One Mm. in 1878 and the other in 1897. Unfortunately... That's got to be more than just a coincidence now. Uh, Waters. Knows? I mean, what are the chances of that? I don't know. Now, they did say it was, a, it was a common name in the area. Who knows? But what it says is it says that while it's possible, uh, it, well, it says that the children's first names were never recorded, only the last names. And while it's possible that one of these could have been an Eric Waters communicating with the Andrews family, statistically speaking, it's probably unlikely that that's the case again even if it could be likely we're never going to know because the first names were never recorded so even if you somehow could draw a line connect a dot from the andrews house to those children uh you're never going to know because there were no first names um what i like about this case is like a lot of other poltergeist cases, mm-hmm. the poltergeist activity is awesome. I mean, I, I love that stuff. I love, while I think the family is absolutely fucking stupid for playing with it, uh, and, uh, you know, kids, if you're in a house, an old house, any house really, and you're in a bedroom and there's a ghostly knock, that asks your 12-year-old sister to lay on the bed before continuing on a conversation. Um, Shut that motherfucker down, okay? Don't play around. And while I am not a superstitious person by any means, uh, while I generally don't believe in curses, hauntings, things like that, I think there's a lot of other... Uh, re, you know, explanations for what that could be other than just ghosts and whatnot. Um, I also am not, I, I don't gamble. I'm not a gambler, especially with things that I don't understand. I say that while at the same time admitting that I've played with a Ouija board. But again, I believe that it is belief that fuels those things. People will argue all day long that uh, that uh, Ouija boards are dangerous. And I say, yeah, in the hands of someone who believes that they're going to get haunted from a Ouija board, then touches the Ouija board with that energy going into it, which could probably ignite that engine that then stirs some shit up. But I feel like I have a bit of a... a uh, I guess a get out of jail free card. I'm probably naive in thinking this, but I do think this because I don't put the energy into the belief to put myself at risk for this. You know, like there's this whole thing of like, of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, possession. 
right? A, a demonic possession. And when you look at it, the majority of the time, the people that are demonically possessed, you know, it, according to these reports, whether they're true or not, that's a whole nother thing. But according to the reports, the majority of people that are possessed demonically are incredibly religious people. Hmm. The people that seem to go through a, a incredibly rare phenomenon called stigmata, which is the manifestation wounds of the crucifixion, which there are compelling cases of that being having happened again, almost exclusively the people that that happens to are deeply religious, meaning that. It, oh, yeah. Ben, get this. Yes. Diana Pasulka, author of American Cosmic, and she was a religious study who studied uh, paranormal phenomena as well as the UFO phenomena. Yes. But in terms of the stigmata and the power of belief, she relates a story of when the Catholic Church, right, they would always talk about how Jesus, I guess the site of the nails and the crucifixion, how I guess, decades, decades ago they said that Christ was uh, nailed in his arms, right? And then people would correspondingly have a characteristic in their arms. But when the church moved the nail in in, in their, uh, you know, I guess in their teachings from the arm to the hand. Oh, yeah. Subsequently, people would suffer the stigmata of the injury in the hand, the, these Catholic Instead of believers, the wrist. right? Yep, Instead exactly. of the wrist, yeah. And it follows yeah. the changing of the doctrine, which says... Because why would it? If it was a phenomenon that was based on the actual wounds of the actual crucifixion, it wouldn't matter how it changes. It wouldn't matter. It would it because it would only reflect the true crucifixion if it was a real phenomenon as opposed to a psychological phenomenon. And so, so again, I think a lot of this, and I'm not saying that it's always this case, but I think a lot of these cases are brought on by people believing this is the case and inviting subconsciously aware or not inviting this into their lives simple by simply through belief it is the pathway to phenomenon and you can look at it time and time again why are atheists not having spiritual uh, encounters why are atheists mm. not having ghostly encounters because mm. they don't believe it you know, why is it? And, and look, I, I consider myself a great example of this. And I people argue with me all the time about this. But I consider myself a great example because I don't believe or disbelieve. I simply want to see. I want to see whatever it is, however it manifests, whatever it is. I want to see. I don't have a preconceived notion of what I'm going to see, how I'm going to see it, or where it's going to be. Any of that. Because I don't necessarily believe I'm going to have an experience. Why would I? I never have. So what's going to lead me to believe that I will? You know, I so my whole thing is like, well, I'm going to wait and see. And I believe that part of, you know, people have said before, well, you have to believe it if you want to see it. And I go, that breaks the whole point of it. That's if, like a self-fulfilling. Yes. Huh? Yes. Yeah, if I yeah, have to yeah. believe it in order to see it, I'm manifesting. It. It's me. I'm looking at me. I'm not looking at God. I'm not looking at Jesus. I'm not looking at a, an angel. I'm not looking at a demon, an alien, or anything otherwise. I'm looking at a reflection of a part of my brain, a chemical makeup that took the energy that is my belief and turned it into, as we've talked about before, where people say the aliens can become whatever you want them to be. That's the core right there, whatever you want it to be. Because and you... here's the thing, Ben, here's the thing, and to put a nice bow on how eloquently you just described it, Thank you. Colvin himself, in the final report that was published as recently as 2008, he states that, uh, he concludes that Eric was probably not an actual discarnate entity, but of a living subconscious mind, namely Teresa's, the child, in a That's case right. of what he calls recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis and really quick the definition of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis uh it says here um let's see this concept 
a characteristic of a living agent and as the cause of poltergeist effects individual or involuntarily employing the, this uh rspk to exteriorize repressed internal feelings of anguish yep and how it comes out in and manifests in our external and uh interaction with our environment or others i think that is i i mean one of my favorite things that I watched was, I can't remember the guy's name now, but there's a video on YouTube called DMT is disclosure. And when you talk to people that are having these psychedelic experiences, they are meeting entities. They are conversing and communing with entities. Uh, Mm. So again, to me, that says more for our own consciousness than it does for any external phenomenon. I think, I think we are the key. Our brains, our consciousness, this thing, whatever it is that makes us human, whatever it is that the spirit is, you know, whatever. I believe that has far more to do with all the phenomena we see than any natural energies, any external technology, anything like that. I really, really feel like it is. It is. You know, uh, uh, it's it's a jambalaya of, you know, brain chemicals, belief, uh, consciousness, and everything that makes us, us, all projected into some beam that because it is so unique to the individual and so varied based on every little thing that makes us think the way we think, uh, that that's why there is such a varying degree of experiences as opposed to the actual variety of phenomenon. We are the variety. Our consciousness is the, the palette and our energy is the brush. And it's as simple as that. And I think that's a lot of what's going on to me. That's, wow, that's, that's why I, bro. That is so poetic. So you're saying or suggesting that we, in essence, are the phenomena itself. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. I mean, huh. dude, the more we learn about consciousness and ourselves, the more we learn how much our reality is made by us. I mean, think about that. Think about all the studies that have come out about the nature of reality, how we perceive reality, consciousness. Everything points inward. Everything points inward, not outward. It points to us, more parts of the brain producing this chemical and that chemical. Look how much they found that DMT is produced in the body, not just in the pineal gland, but also the liver, certain muscle tissue. It seems to it seems to be produced everywhere. It's in plants, it's in other animals, it's in everything. So it's it's it has I think it has far more to do with something like that. Um, but again, this is what makes it fun, man is this whole we don't know and uh and that's that's what comes down to it and then from there we get to separate the piles right into facts and into fuckery and that's where we're leading into next let's get into some news shall we monkey pox Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Oh, it's facts and fuckery. We're about ready to get into it, everybody. We're about ready to get into it. So right off the bat, what are we going to talk about, huh? What are we going to talk about? A little bit of monkeypox action. That's right. Lions and tigers and monkeypox. Oh, my. Yeah. So it's, uh, look, there's a lot coming for this. Uh, so I got a whole little presentation of uh, how I believe this is just uh, one big, you know, similar You know, basically four years ago, we went through a giant uh, smash and grab capture maneuver. um, And I think we're doing it again, except now it's the pox of the monkey. And uh, Disease X is what they were calling it for a while, but now it's got a name. Um, So let's talk first of all, or let's look at, um, right off the bat, we've got this guy, um, Tedros. Tedros. 
Uh, from the who, and I'm not even trying to pronounce that name, Tedros at Hamama, whatever the fuck. Uh, but uh, he is from the who, and he just declared that monkeypox constitutes, and I quote, a public health emergency of international concern. Huh? Deja vu, anybody? Here we go. Let's see what this guy has to say. Today, the emergency committee met and advised me that, in its view, the situation constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. I have accepted that advice. The detection and rapid spread of a new clade of MPOX in Eastern DRC, its detection in neighboring countries that had not previously reported MPOX, and the potential for further spread within Africa and beyond is very worrying. In addition to other out breaks of other clades of MPOX in other parts of Africa, it's clear that a coordinated international response is essential to stop these outbreaks and save lives. International response is what they're calling for, is what they're calling for. Now, if we think back on what was monkeypox, do you remember? Do you remember what they said when it first came out about what monkeypox yeah, was? Sup- Supposedly, it was a virus Mm -hmm. and that people, or particularly gay men, men who have sex with men... Yeah, that's the way they described it. Yeah, exactly. In those words, exactly. Men who have sex with men. They didn't say gay guys. They didn't say any of that. They said men who have sex with men, specifically. Specifically, yeah. Yeah. So that's what they were saying, and yet, and yet, this is an international health concern. Let me ask you a question, George. Do you have sex with men? Fuck no. You know what? I've made it this far in my life without (laughs) tattoos, piercings, herpes, sucking on a dog, or getting anything in my butt. So I think I'm doing great. (laughs) Well, I only do it when it gets cold. But, uh, you know, that's... uh, Right. uh, (laughs) But what I'm getting at is, like, this is not an international concern, okay? This is not a global concern. This is not... This is literally one demographic of people. One. And that is men who have sex with other men that's it that is it it's not it's it's wild how they're making this out to be now here's what i want to get to next is because like who the fuck is this guy you know what i mean like who the fuck is this guy that's coming out and saying what we should do and that there should be a globe now we know the who is up in everybody's shit right so that's concerning but who's this guy So let's take a look from the Great Book of Knowledge, Wikipedia. Uh, What we have here is we have uh, Tetros, whatever the fuck, uh, sometimes spelt whatever the hell that is, um, is an Ethiopian public health official, researcher, diplomat, and the director general health of the WHO since 2017. Tedros is the first African to become a WHO director general, receiving endorsement for the role by the African Union. He played a role in the response to the Ebola virus epidemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the 2023 to, or 2022 to 2023 MPOX outbreak. They don't even call it monkeypox anymore. They just call it MPOX. Um, constantly changing stuff. And prior to serving as director general, he held two high-level positions in the government of Ethiopia, Minister of Health uh, 2005 to 2012, and Minister of Foreign Affairs from uh, 2012 to 2016. And of course, he was included in the Times 100 Most Influential People of 2020. Uh, Go get fucked, Tedros. That's what I'm going to say. I don't know you, but I don't like you. So, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that because already you're trying to tell me what to do. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't represent me. That's what I always fall on. You don't represent me. So Tedros is another unelected official from a whole nother country that is now dictating what we are going to do here in the United States, right? Of course, of course. But then on top of this, now, it's one thing to have the who coming out and saying, hey, 
it's a public health emergency and it's of international concern. But then we have this person who is uh, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, or whatever, of the WHO, who is now demanding worldwide surveillance in order to manage this global emergency. So it's not just about uh, the uh, you know a public health emergency. It's about grabbing control while we're at it. So here's Dr. Maria Van whatever the fuck t- telling us uh, how she needs or how they need the WHO need to get worldwide surveillance to protect people from the dangerous monkeypox. A lot of uncertainty that we have. We really need detailed studies. We really need to understand not only the transmission, but we also need to understand the natural history. We need to see the disease patterns. We need standardized data collection on the patients that are infected with MPOX. So that, doesn't that mean, tell, correct me if I'm wrong here, George. The fact that she's saying we need data on these People, we need data on this disease. We need data how it transmits, how it does this, who's getting it, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't that mean they don't fucking know? They don't fucking know. So how are they coming to the conclusion that the monkey pox, the men who have sex with men disease, let's just get that out of the way, okay, is a public health emergency when they don't know how it spread other than obviously anal intercourse, uh, you know, shoving, uh, 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 you know, uh, Twizzlers up each other's pee holes, I would imagine it's probably not a great idea, you know? So like all these things that is one demographic is doing, they don't know any of this shit. So the, it's a public, it's a global emergency in which like before one of the mistakes that was admitted that they made is they made decisions before knowing fully what they were up against, right? It's admitted. Everybody now after the COVID shit is going, uh, you know, at the time we didn't know we were going based off initial reports. And that was the, was, uh, was the mistake. You didn't wait to find out. You didn't wait to find out what was going on and to, to interpret the data. You just made moves to gather control because it might be bad. And look at this, deja vu 2.0. So let's continue on with Dr. Maria, who gives a fuck. So that we could better understand the disease course, the severity of this, and it, most importantly, to make sure that not only are we focusing on prevention measures, but we're utilizing therapeutics and having therapeutic guidelines. Hey, don't fuck butts. How about that? That's a good preventative. Hey, don't put your dick in an asshole. Let's start with that. Um, updated based on the evidence that we have. With regards to transmission, there's multiple modes of transmission that we- You can joust. You know what I mean? Like you can do, you can, there's a number of ways you can do this without putting in each other's butts. Get creative. That's how you started it, right? That's how you started this. It's like, you know, I'm kind of bored with the one hole. What should we do? Oh, there's another hole. You know what I mean? So like, just get creative and start like putting it in a nostril or something really need to better understand. Primarily what we are seeing is the contact type uh, transmission. Butt fucking. That's what they're talking about. Um, we- she rubbed her hands together, like rubbing your hands together is doing it. What she should have done is this and this being a furry butthole and this being a furry dick and going, you know what I'm saying? So like that wrong gang signs, Maria. We have seen sexual transmission, which is really what is concerning us. Um, and now we have seen this virus, the different clades, and in particular clade 1B in sexual networks. And this is where we need to have targeted interventions, stronger surveillance, stronger contact tracing, stronger risk communication, community engagement with affected communities, with CSOs, with people on the ground so that we could limit that onward spread. Um, we've said this before. You've heard DG say this. You've heard Mike say this many times. We can stop transmission of mpox with stop fucking butts a concerted effort using a multiple approaches in terms of looking at how the virus is transmitting in which populations we do see it we know it's the men who have sex with men transmission among families as well we do see zoonotic transmission uh, in addition to that So so wait a minute let's get this straight what did she just fucking say Hold on. Did she just throw in their families and zoo as in animals? 
Hold on, let's let's Multiple hear multiple approaches in terms of looking at how the virus is transmitting in which populations. We do see transmission among families as well. We do see new zoonotic. Uh, how are the families getting it, Miss Maria? How are the families getting it? If it's men who have sex with men via anal sex, how are the families getting it? Hmm. Hmm. It's a real puzzle. It's a real puzzle. Like transmission uh, in addition to that. So these are the primary ways that we are seeing this virus spread. So we need strong surveillance and good diagnostics. Our diagnostics teams are working um, to better understand the use of the current PCR tests, the other tests that exist that are out there to distinguish between clade one, clade two. And so there's some improvement that's needed certainly there. Um, the other thing is, of course, access, access to these tests. We saw during COVID. Um, a All right. Anyways, I'm done with her. So uh, uh, she goes right into saying, just like COVID, you know, just like COVID, like we didn't learn anything. You know, clearly it's the same play. It's the exact same play. And now, Ben, I got a solution because, you know, this is reminiscent of COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, the single thing that we can do as Americans to not get monkey paw. <laughs> well, I've said it multiple times. We can also, Ben, take our COVID mask and cover our buttholes with it. That's right. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. See, what you need to do is take that shitty mask that you've been wearing anyways, that's got all the shit on it that's poisoning you anyways, because you never wash it, you never change it, none of that. And just take that and shove it straight up your ass. Just shove it straight up your ass, right? And so then what happens is when you queef, because you're a pussy, what happens is, is that it catches all that uh, you know, that that would be monkey pox that you're going to spread uh, through your butthole vagina and it's going to uh, get caught in uh, in that shitty fucking mask that you just shoved up your ass. So just wad it up, just wad it up in a little ball, probably a big ball for you, but just whatever size ball is going to fit appropriately in that gaping asshole of yours and then just shove it up there. And you know what I mean? And quit fucking but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's just like, wow, how do we prevent this outbreak? Hmm. Boy. Hmm. It's just such a conundrum. Anyways. So now we have, now we have to emphasize the surveillance. You know, we have this guy, uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Ryan, uh, talking about the MPOX global health emergency um, that is going to hammer home the whole surveillance. And tell me this is not a script that's been put out to everybody to talk about the global health emergency and the worldwide surveillance that's needed to catch this. You know, oh, so uh, it's, uh, it's just an enigma. It's a virus that can be contained. The world needs to, in this case, as it did for COVID and in other diseases, come together to make sure that we're doing surveillance together. We're supporting communities together. We're providing good clinical care, that there's access to countermeasures, that the research and development agenda is advanced, that there's political commitment, that there's political commitment, coordination, and finally, and probably at this point, crucially, that there is financial commitment. Oh, money? What? Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? Control, it's about control and money? Oh my God, I'm shocked. To stop this virus. It was amazing to me that even in the large scale MPOX outbreak we had around the world, there was no funding made available for the control of that at international level. We're having to once again dip into the contingency fund for emergencies to begin the process. Oh, the contingency fund for emergencies oh they're just draining the pot so you know what they need is you to donate to the poor monkey pox victims fucking stupid dude fucking stupid this is the exact same concept i feel and maybe this is heartless i don't know i don't really care but you know it's like this is the whole i consider this as much of an outbreak as uh as cyberbullying right Cyberbullying is the dumbest shit I've ever heard of in my life because when I was a kid, uh, there was no such thing as a cyber and I got bullied. 
But it wasn't as simple as just turning off the PC or the laptop. I actually had to go to school and I actually got bullied in real life. And you know what? Here I am talking shit on the internet. So you too can be a normal person, you know, with, with, you're going to make it. Okay. But this whole idea of like, oh no, I can't escape my online bullying. Turn that shit off. It's real. It's really that easy. And like this, this and like, oh man, how are we going to stop the spread of monkey pox? Quit putting your dicks in butts. That's it. That's it. And quit putting a dick in a family member's butt since it's spreading to families. And since they mentioned animals, oh, which fuck. is fucking wild, quit fucking your animals too. And maybe, just maybe, we'll get through this thing. But like clearly this guy, this guy, this Dr. David, whatever, dude, this guy's riddled with monkey box. I bet he is. I bet he's just riddled with it. You know, he looks gay as fuck. Anyways, so... You know, so, und okay, so what we've been discussing so far is, you know, the who, the WHO coming, all these unelected people that are coming up with what we do, right? Who is the who? Who are they? Who are these motherfuckers that are making all this shit? Now, here's a guy, uh, David Martin, who is a businessman, uh, he's a professor, he's an author, he's a storyteller, inventor, global foresight advisory, general self-help dude. Uh, I put a uh, uh, thing in the show notes. You go and check it out for yourself who this guy is. Um, I don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. In this case, it doesn't really matter because what he's saying is true. And what he's doing is he's giving us a little background on who the who is. Here he goes. The World Health Organization was a criminal racketeering organization as defined by the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. And by that I mean interlocking directorates defined under the Clayton Act, racketeering and express market domination and market controls, all of which are defined under the Sherman Act. This was a violation of the law when it was set up in the 1940s. And we have to go back to the foundation of what the WHO is and recognize since 1953, it has been exclusively a vaccine promoting enterprise for the benefit of the people who have commercial interest in vaccines. If you read their opening charter and all of the hearings that gave rise to their opening charter from Bretton Woods in July of 1944 to its actually founding charter in 1950 and 53. What's missing from those conversations is who is writing the checks. And back then, and you can look, and it's all in a matter of public record, Rockefeller Foundation and the Wellcome Trust were the check writers. Giant surprise. Why were they writing the check for establishing the World Health Organization? And if you think it was because we wanted to have information sharing and research and scientific collaboration. Which, it, now, I pause that there because I want you to think about what all these dipshits in ufology are saying when they come forward with their little fancy story about how they saw some shit locked up in uh, whatever the fuck. Oh, I'm doing this for humanity. I'm doing this because the American people deserve to know. But I'm also getting paid for interviews, and I'm getting paid for my book, and I'm getting paid for this, and I'm making a reputation. I get to go to all of the nerdy parties, and you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like a lot of incentive to say what they're saying. So when he said, again... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replay that real quick, what the specific term that he used. Information sharing. And oh, hold on, sorry. Let me go back just a little bit further. So we wanted to have information sharing and research and scientific collaboration. Right? Isn't that exactly what they argue? Scientific knowledge and collaboration. Right? That's exactly what they say. And that's, that's exactly what these people say in order to get you to sign off on it. And that's the number one red flag that everyone should have. And I don't care who it is in the government. I don't care who it is. All this idea of white hats in the government, they want you to think they're wearing white hats. They would love for you to believe that. They would love for you to believe there's a craft locked up in Area 51 from Roswell. They would love for you to believe that. So that way they can continue to test their shit out in the open. Easy scapegoat. Easy scapegoat. So it's just, it's wild 
that you hear the exact same terminology and phrasing used in every single corrupt narrative that's put out to the public as though it's something for the public. And it, disclosure is the exact same thing. It's a capture maneuver because they're using the same language. Same language. What were we going to say? Look, it's, it's, it's like a manufactured kind of a scheme. It's a script. That's couched. Yeah, that, that's couched in idealism to, to benefit everybody. Yeah. But yet there, there are these industries that are that are behind the curtain that stand to profit because they're pushing this narrative. And for you to make that that correlation between what's going on in, in in ufology, you know, when people try to put out these stories and and when they get all these book deals and fucking movie deals and and you know they do these interviews and they're on News Nation, for instance, and they get paid all this money. It's it's like a it's like a slick way to to kind of capture like uh, attention through sensationalism. And, and make a pretty penny on the side. You know what they call that, George? Propaganda. Propaganda. That's right. That's the term for it is exactly that, is to sway a narrative and, and probably profit off of it. And they profit off of it, whether it's monetarily or not, whether it's control, whether it's status, whatever it is. They capitalize on it. And that's exactly what it is. It's propaganda. But let's continue on. Then you're actually not reading the actual records from those meetings because those records were about distribution of drugs. Those were ways in which we could actually force drugs onto countries so that they actually had to take dumped drugs that were dumped out of Germany, the UK, and the US, and they had to adopt those. So, so you're right. I mean, exactly what you're saying. In an interconnected world where we have air travel and sea travel and we have all of the flow of people, we absolutely should have the ability to monitor and surveil the condition of health so that we have an awareness that says, hey, there's a problem, let's intervene. But the problem is that we have to have a financially disinterested party making those determinations and making those surveillance observations. Which is never going to happen. Never going to happen. You're, you're going to, you, nobody has the money. to. So you need money to go up against these people. You have to. So where there's money involved, you have the potential for corruption. So it is literally a catch-22. You have to get the money out of it in order to remove, you know, de-incentivize corruption. But by removing the money out of it, you also remove every bit of momentum. So you have to find ways, which I don't even, I think this is one of the biggest problems regarding everything involving transparency in government is there is no because uh, incentive to do it period there's no incentive to do it because if you if you don't raise money look at every politician that didn't raise money tried to do the right thing without money they're not there they're not there they get run out they get pushed out they get run over by all the money that is there and that's the biggest problem. So, so I don't think you can de-incentivize it, um, the corruption. And I think, you know, the, the corruption's just going to keep continuing because, uh, you know, there has to be. What you have to do is you have to start punishing, to the fullest extent of the law. And I think you know what I'm talking about. You have to have proper punishment for these crimes to de-incentivize because you can't go up against the money. But if you punish the corruption, you know, effectively enough, then you could quell the corruption. But money-wise, you're not going to you're not going to you're not going to kumbaya your way into a better situation, which is what a lot of people think is going to happen and I don't think I don't think that's the case at all. You know, at all. And so uh, the majority of these people that make these decisions for us are not elected. So you're voting for a guy, a handful of people that are supposed to represent you, that are supposed to go up against the multitude of non-elected people that actually make decisions. Good fucking luck. Good fucking luck. Hey, we gave you a badge and a red star. Now go fight for us. And meanwhile, there's a sea of things they don't even know exist that come up against them when they try.
So that's what we're up against. Whether it's, you know, fixing the corruption in government, getting transparency regarding what the fuck is actually going on with UFOs. None of it is going to be able to move an inch unless we get rid of the intelligence communities. I've said it before and I will say it again. Defund the fucking CIA, the NSA, the FDA, the, the, the Department of Education, the DEA, you name it. Get rid of them. What are they doing for us? Nothing. They're not doing a goddamn thing except spending our money on bullshit. Not only bullshit, they're actually using our money to take control of us, which is the worst part about it. We're funding our own demise, which is the worst. But let's move on to some lighter news, shall we? Shall we? Our slave numbers have been stolen! There is no good news. That's the uh, that's the that's the good news. Bad news is just we can accept it. <laughs> we just can accept it. Is there, there? There's none. There's none. So uh, according to this this uh, article uh, from uh, who is this from? Uh, hold on just a second. Where did uh, New York Post? Um, sensitive personal data. Have you heard about this, George? A little bit, but go into it. Yeah, so sensitive personal data belonging to every American. We're talking about 2.7 roughly billion people, almost 3 billion people, including social security numbers, addresses, date of birth, phone numbers, basically everything someone needs uh, to steal your identity has allegedly been stolen and put up for sale on the dark web by hackers. Uh, Here's where I call bullshit. Why would hackers do that when the federal government already has that information and already sells it to third parties? Why why would I believe a hacker stole my information and put it up for sale when I know for a fucking fact the NSA has done that time after time after time? Hackers, they need a scapegoat. They need a scapegoat, Ben, because Absolutely. maybe their plan kind of great reset ah. or some kind of fucking their manufactured depression or recession or whatever have you. Any, so they're, they're whatever. Who knows? Groundwork. I mean, yeah. they already have everybody's identity. It's kind of laughable. You know, the reason I bring this up is it's laughable that they're making it out like, oh, my God, everybody's numbers have been leaked. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you got a spam call? How did they get your phone number? Probably from your third-party data information being sold from a reputable government agency. How much you want to bet? Mm-hmm. So, All the time. Ac- yeah. According to a lawsuit filed against Jericho Pictures, Inc., which operates as national public data, uh, the cyber criminal group USDOD... <laughs> You're tell you're telling me that there's a cyber group who named themselves the acronym for the US Department of Defense. Dude, give me a fucking break. How I mean, give me a fucking break. A crim a cyber criminal group known as the US Department of Defense. Jesus reportedly uploaded a database titled National Public Data to a dark web forum, offering the information for 3.5 million. The database allegedly contained. Now, that's another thing is you're telling me that a cyber group that knows how much data is worth is going to steal almost 3 billion people's worth of data, and yet they're only going to sell it for 3.5 million million so let's let's do some numbers here let's do some numbers here hold on just a second hey google how much is 3 billion divided by 3.5 million ah damn it of course let me let me just punch it into the chat gbt real quick that reminds me of that Austin Powers movie where uh, Dr. Evil was <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. ransoming the world and he asked for $1 million and they yeah. all laughed at it, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's do, let's do the math on here because I'm telling you that is the weakest 
ransom note I've ever heard in my life. You got 3 billion people's data and you're going to sell it for pennies on the dollar? Pennies on the dollar? <laughs> Fucking st stupid, dude. All right, so here's what it says. It's got to teach me how to do it first. It's like, well, first, here's how we find it. So 3 billion divided by 3.5 million is $857.14. So you're telling me that this cyber group is the stupidest cyber group in the history of cyber groups because they couldn't even do the math to realize that they are only getting less than $900 a person for their data. We're talking about, look, think about how much data Facebook gets or money Facebook gets for data. You think they're getting more than $850 per person? Oh, totally. You think Instagram, Twitter, all these places that use your data and make money from that, you think they're making more than $857.14 per American? Probably. So that doesn't make sense. That does not make sense. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So right now, from what I can tell, this is straight up government because only government would lowball themselves that bad. <laughs> And not be able to do the math, a bunch of DMV ladies that are sitting behind a desk going, well, how much should we ask for? Yeah. So yeah, the, yeah. the database, again, <laughs> allegedly contains personal data of nearly 3 billion people across the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. However, cybersecurity experts believe the actual number of affected individuals is likely smaller due to duplicate records. The class action lawsuit filed in Fort Lauderdale on August 1st was initiated by California resident Christopher Hoffman, who learned from an identity theft watchdog that his data had been exposed. Hoffman is demanding that NPD delete all personal information from its records and implement uh, encryption for future data. To protect yourself, cybersecurity experts recommend freezing your credit card files your credit cards, your debit cards, all that stuff, major bureaus like uh, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, get out all those is what it's saying. It also recommends using two-factor authentication uh, for monitoring your bank accounts. Um, and it says if you suspect your social security number has been leaked, I mean, look, there's 8 billion of us, right, in the world. So What are the chances of them selecting you? Right? For real. Well, let's yeah. do the math on this, okay? Let's do the math on this. It said U.S., U.K., and Canada. It said 3 billion people. So we're going to do some math. How many people in the U.S.? Let's find oh, out. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that, that'd well, be Well, I'm a, doing the math. So here it, it says 334 okay. million. All right. So how many people in the U.K.? Um, 68 million. All right, how many in Canada? We're going to find out how many people we're actually talking about. 40 million. So how many total for all three countries? If I could spell countries. So we are looking at 442 million people. So what percentage is that of 3 billion? Come on, baby. 14.73% of 3 billion. So in other words, right, if I'm not mistaken, you got about a 15% chance that your number's been stolen. 15%. So, uh, if you don't like those odds, <laughs> I recommend you start digging into it. Um, but uh, the other thing they say is to um, 
change your passwords, watch for unusual activity. There's a guy, Justin Rush, a Michigan-based financial planner, said he recommends freezing your credit cards, your debit cards. Generally a good habit to get into in case of a bad actor tries to apply for a credit card or a loan in your name. But here's what they say. Most importantly, they say, from this, it's entirely possible that someone the following tax season will attempt to file a fraudulent tax return in your name. That's wild. So keep that in mind. People that get child uh, child uh, tax credit or whatever, if you're in a relationship yes. where somebody every other year claims your kid, don't assume that that's what's going on. Make sure and check your shit out and get on that because it could be that uh, – that, uh, you know, somebody's stolen your identity. Who knows, man? Who knows? But again, look, I don't believe for a minute, a minute that this was some cyber security group called USDOD that actually did this. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe this was 100% a, a leak within. This was an intentional sale that happened to get out to the public and now they're doing recovery. They're like, Oh fuck. But I, I think this is one of many, one of many that they've probably done. Um, so yeah. So anyways, watch out for your taxes, watch out for your number, who knows, but just watch your shit. You know what I mean? Keep an eye on it. But, uh, yeah. All right. So now let's move on to, well, do you have anything to say about that before we move on, George? Fuck, that, that is, like, you know, for you to theorize that perhaps it could be an element of our government that, that might have... Oh, I'm not theorizing. I'm flat it. out saying it. I'm flat out saying it. Whether I, it was intentional or, like, a cover for, like, an actual fuck-up, right? I mean, dude, I I think when it comes to things like that, it's it's not... There are no such thing as accidents, you know, mm. the fact that two point five trillion dollars went up missing, you know, and it was it was right you know, before nine right eleven. Before 9/11 not an accident. The fact yeah. that, you know, yeah. three hundred and something, you know, billion dollars or million or whatever it was was found over in Ukraine of extra mm -hmm. money, not an accident. Not an accident. I don't believe any of this. You know, there's a lot of people out there that love to say, oh, well, you know, it's it's probably not a conspiracy. It's probably just a bunch of stupid people. It's like I've said before, dude, you could not be. You could look, you could have the strongest form of Down syndrome. And I love Down syndrome people. Don't get me wrong. I love the Downies. OK, but let me just say this. You could be. Let's not even throw the Down syndrome people in there. They are a beautiful set of people. Let's set them aside, okay? I'm only talking about the real, real dumb fucks, all right? The inbreds, the, you know what I'm talking about, okay? The real, real dumbasses. You could not have a good heart and fuck up this bad without acknowledging you're, you're doing something wrong if you had a good heart. You know, like that's my thing is like these people clearly are bad people doing bad things for bad reasons and and it's not like oh they're good people that are just confused and overwhelmed now oh, fuck all that shit corrupt inhuman motherfuckers that deserve to die a hundred percent one hundred percent and it's gonna take a lot of convincing to convince me otherwise you know what i mean but now let's get mm -hmm. into some alien talk, shall we? Let's talk about this alien bacteria, baby. Have you heard about this, George, from uh, Columbia University? Are they equating this with monkeypox? <laughs> <laughs> uh, alien bacteria? Nope, nope, nope. That would be uh, that would be ass bacteria if it was uh, monkeypox. It would not be alien bacteria. <laughs> No, so alien bacteria, what it is, is researchers at Columbia University have discovered that bacteria can create free-floating genes outside their chromosomes. 
a finding that challenges long-held beliefs about genomes. This alien biology has left scientists in disbelief and could have far-reaching implications beyond bacteria, possibly even affecting human genetics. The study, led by Associate Professor Samuel Sternberg and MD, PhD student Stephen Tang, revealed that a bacterial defense system produces a free-floating gene dubbed NEO. Oh which plays a crucial role in antiviral defense. This discovery suggests that not all genetic instructions are confined to chromosomes, potentially revolutionizing our understanding of genetics. The team is now exploring whether similar extra chromosomal genes exist in higher organisms, including humans. If found, these genes could open new avenues for gene editing technologies, building on recent advancements like CRISPR. Sternberg believes bacteria may hold many more reverse transcriptases. Transcriptases? Is that a word you're familiar with? Trans? <laughs> Trans <laughs> transcriptases. Hold on. I need to know what this is. Tran transcriptases. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme used to convert RNA genome to DNA, a process termed reverse transcription. Oh, I didn't know that. So reverse transcriptases is uh, RNA to DNA. That could lead to innovative biotechnological applications in the future. So I'm wow. hoping for... My fingers are crossed, baby. My fingers are crossed. Give us longevity. And I mean, I want a bigger penis. But also, I want to live for a thousand years. I would love that. Uh, a thousand years with a big old hog? Dude. Dude. I, I, I mean, come on. Talk about my 13-year-old wish come true. I mean, you know. I, I mean, Santa got so many letters of just a picture of a big hog hanging from a, you know, from a, a prepubescent boy. Um, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I even told him, I said, Santa, I'll name it Nick. You know, <laughs> I'll name it Nick. Nick the dick. <clears throat> you know, it just rolls right off the tongue, man. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm i pushing for uh, when it comes to genetics that it is going to uh, help us live longer because Lord knows. I just want to look a lot of people are always like, oh, man, watching everybody die around you and all that stuff. It's like a lot of people go through that anyways, and then they die anyways. It's like I would I would rather. I mean, yes, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard when my parents die. It's going to be hard when those people die around you and you have to live beyond. But that doesn't mean that you want to stop living. Right. Most people after their parents die, they continue on. So how is this any different? You know, I, I would just, you know, a lot of people are like, dude, you would outlive your kid. It's like some people do that. Some mm -hmm. people outlive their kids for whatever reason, uh, you know, illness, uh, accidents, whatever. Aliens, who knows? But all I'm saying is like, I want to see what comes next. I am so, I mean, imagine those people that were born in, I mean, there's a lot of people now that, you know, were born in the 1900s that aren't around now. You know, I mean, that's that's barely 100 years. A lot, I mean, think of how much is going to change in the next 100 years, dude. Think Even with the way things are going on now with the world, I mean, you, you mentioned monkeypox, the, the economy collapsing, <laughs> you know, we, we got all this bad stuff in the news. What is into the future. I mean, could you really see yourself putting up with this this bullshit times a thousand? I mean, even oh, cyberbullying the other day. <laughs> you know, and how how it kind of complicates life, you know, with with the infusion of this technology, right? I mean, I, I mean, do you really want to live that long? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I I you know, I'm 42, okay? And even in my time, it wasn't always like this. I mean, we're I, I'm I'm looking at the last five years. The last five years is the, when all this really ramped up.
of like shit going bad. And if you look in history, there's a lot of times when it looked real bad. It looked like shit was not going to get better. And it did. I mean, look at the Great Depression. You know, look at World War II. Look at World War I. Look at Vietnam. Things mm. got better. And I bet you a lot of people in those moments thought mm -hmm. the same way. Like, why would I want to live through this? What? How could it possibly get any better? And it did. Mm -hmm. So I look at it as, even though it sucks and there's a lot of bad shit going on, I do not for any, for a single moment, even entertain the idea that it's going to last a thousand years. I would be... I would be absolutely, completely shocked if this turmoil that we're going through right now is going to last a thousand years. I mean, maybe five more, maybe 10 more, let's say even 20, if things don't improve dramatically. But even then, a thousand years down the road, dude, we're talking, you know, 10 generations, basically. And I really believe that in 10 generations, Somebody, some people, some entity, some thing is going to come along that is going to steer this ship back on track. And maybe what it's going to take is people that have perspective beyond their lifetime. So think about what it's going to take for humans to stop thinking about the short-term gains of individuals. It's going to take aging slower. It's going to take people having the perspective of 100, 200, 300 years to get out of this short-term gain mentality of uh, I'm only going to do it for me. Well, you got a thousand years, motherfucker, to live with uh -huh. yourself and your actions. I think uh -huh. that could truly bring people out of this selfish, materialistic endeavor is the perspective of that it's I am the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So I'm not just going to say I'm only here for 50 years, 70 years, whatever it is. I don't really give a fuck. No, nope, you're in it for a thousand years. How much do you think people are going to make it better when that's the case? How much? Let me temper your idealism for a Please, bit. Please, let's do it. If they're able to reverse engineer alien bacteria and extend our life expectancy into hundreds of years, yeah. who do you think this technology is going to be available <laughs> to and how much? Of course. How much is it going to cost and of can course, you and sure. I afford it? Yeah. Well, but think about insulin. All right. Think about insulin when it was first invented. It probably was not available to the average person. It was only available to those who, within the know who could afford it. But then eventually it becomes a, a publicly accessible drug. So I think that I think you could argue both ways. I think you could argue that, yes, human nature, greed, all these things could absolutely, per, you know, uh, um, persist. But what generally gets people out of these behaviors is perspective. You know, I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Graham Hancock says that I love is that no one should be allowed to take office without 30 trips on ayahuasca. And I love that idea. I love that idea. So I'm not saying that, you know, we could just live for a thousand years and do things the way we're doing. It's certainly going to take change. No matter what, no matter how long we live, it doesn't matter if life, you know, uh, lifespans get shorter, longer, doesn't matter. Things have to change. Humans have to get better. We have to be better to ourselves and everybody else. But I think a very big tool that could help humanity do just that is, again, perspective, long-term perspective and the only way to get that is for people to actually see what happens after a thousand years of their actions and maybe if you have that you would have a more enlightened people emerge from that i don't know i don't know i mean you're right it's a very optimistic viewpoint um but i'm just simply looking at 
our history in thousand year chunks. And a thousand years ago, this world looked entirely different. Humanity looked entirely different. It acted entirely different. It, you know what I mean? So I think very likely that is, is the same case with us a thousand years from now. You know, and so a thousand years from now with this altered DNA where we can live well into hundreds of years yeah. and they come up with a new type of bacteria that can extend your life for another 10,000 years this time. When is enough life going to be enough? Like, are, are, do, are you going to be OK with wanting to? Wouldn't that take the excitement out, out of how impermanent and, 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 and value fleeting life is? Right, well, because if you have a lot of life, you're going to take things for granted. Well, if huh? if that is what gives you motivation. If what gives you motivation is the temporary nature of life, then yeah, you're right. Then that that is not going to be. But what if what gives you motivation is vision of a future, of putting into action what you think is going to make change and then actually being able to see that change. So I think it's two different mentalities. It's, you know, I had a great conversation a while back with a guy, Dr. Mark Rial, who wrote a book about CRISPR. And uh, he posed a question, which was, if there was a shot, an injection that allowed you to extend life, stop aging, you know, whatever, or re even reverse aging, would you do mm. it? And it was at a time when me and Bly Mike were doing the show, and I immediately said, yes, I would do it. And Mike was like, no, I wouldn't. And I was shocked. I was actually shocked. I was like, really? And he said, yeah. And I said, you really don't care to see what comes after you? And he said, no, why would I? And I said, I want to see just like I would want to see where we come from. I want to see where we go. I want to see the outcome, you know, and maybe... Either way, it doesn't mean I have to live for a thousand years because maybe my consciousness goes into the universe and I'm able to observe it anyways. But, you know, I mean, to me, it's like these people that claim they want to live forever in heaven. It's like, well, you could make heaven here, you know, and you could just live here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's a very, very philosophical question of really like what your motivations are for life. And you're, you're really touching on it right there. I mean, well, you know, you know, the, the the temporary nature of life is what gives it its spice and excitement. To some, mm -hmm. you're right. But to others, the future and what the possibilities are of that future is what fuels them. And I bet a lot of people that are involved in innovation, invention, things like that, would probably be under that same mind of, I want to see what happens. I want to see what happens. Imagine somebody creating a new form of technology, you know, like the warp drive. And then they're able to see their warp drive a thousand years from then, as opposed to I created a prototype and it didn't get made for 200 years. So now they're long gone and they don't get to see what that, you know, what fruit that bore. I would want to see it. So again, I think it comes down to the the actual mental like what the psychology of an individual which is a whole another i mean dude we could this conversation we could have for a very very long mm -hmm. time i mean this is a very philosophical conversation but but uh, and speaking of another philosophical conversation now we're going to get into aliens and a new study that came out saying no aliens no aliens so we have a recent study by astronomers uh, Dr. David Kipping and Dr. Geraint Lewis, and they suggest that the chances of discovering technologically advanced extraterrestrial civilizations are very slim. Their research argues that the odds are low due to the narrow window of detectability influenced by the rates at which these civilizations emerge and disappear. The study revisits the Drake equation, compressing its variables into two Two key factors, the birth and death rates of civilizations. Uh, if civilizations tend to vanish quickly, the likelihood of detecting them during their communicative uh, phase is extremely low. This challenges the optimistic view that the universe is teeming with intelligent life. 
Kipping and Lewis also discuss the great filter hypothesis, which posits a challenging stage in the development of intelligent life that few civilizations pass, and the zoo hypothesis, which suggests that advanced extraterrestrial life may avoid contact with Earth. However, they find the latter highly unlikely. Despite these sobering conclusions, the researchers advocate for continued SETI efforts, which are the uh, search for extraterrestrial life. Wait, wait. Is that what it is? Intelligence. Yep. SETI. Mm -hmm. uh, arguing that even a slim chance of discovering extraterrestrial intelligence is worth pursuing. They also... Uh, Explore the grabby aliens hypothesis, which suggests that advanced civilizations may expand rapidly, but are rare, making contact unlikely for millions to billions of years. While the scenario doesn't predict imminent contact, it offers a new approach to the search for alien intelligence, suggesting we look beyond our immediate galactic neighborhood. So, I see this as, again another pursuit by another agency trying to distance themselves from ufology. So SETI is coming out and saying there's no such thing as aliens, but we need to still look, but just further. I That to me, they are literally trying to get away from everyone else claiming that aliens are in government. Like, that's what they're trying to, to me, that's what they're trying to do. They don't want to be wrapped up with Lou Elizondo, which is going to happen. They're going to start roping in all these groups, you know, that are that are studying and trying to, trying to capture them and all this. So already, you know, like NASA did, that is trying to distance themselves from all the people that are saying that there's aliens locked up in government. Uh, I see SETI doing the exact same thing by saying that, look, we don't think it's possible that we're going to meet anybody in our galaxy. And I think they're specifically referencing what people are talking about within government. They but are doesn't that, yeah. doesn't that position search for extraterrestrial intelligence? They have all these satellite dishes. Yeah. They've been doing this for decades. But in their charter, it, you know, the purpose is to look for the universe. But yet they come up with this research paper. I mean, it's like they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot, but you're saying that they're trying to keep a distance. Well, think about what the worst shot of the foot is, though, bro. You know, it's either gangrene of religious zealots that are going to take your entire foot off. You know, literally, they cut the legs right out from underneath you like every ufologist has had done and is continuing to do to the entire topic. Or... It's put out a study saying we haven't found anything. We're going to look deeper. I get it. Here's the thing. The scientific method for their methodologies. And a lot of these people and you fall. The empirical evidence. They don't have anything. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And it, it becomes speculation and conjecture. And that's exactly why I have said you are going to see a massive fracture within ufology. The scientific community is going to literally halt and backtrack out of this hard because you got people like Dr. Gary Nolan who is coming out stating for a fact that this is all true and in the name of science. So what do you have? You have the scientific group searching for extraterrestrials going, oh, no, 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 no. Because none of these people are using the scientific method, as I pointed out with Bassett. And so, Dr. Nolan is an immunologist. That's right. You know, he studies like cancer shit. Like, yeah. Do you think he's overstepping his area of Well, expertise? it's like Greer, who was a trauma surgeon, who all of a sudden became a sandaled warrior for fucking disclosure. You know, that's what, it's the same concept. It's the same concept. The exact same thing. So I believe that SETI, while they are not putting, not stating at all, they're not, they're not linking themselves to ufology at all, this is, study is complete as you said it seems contrary to their entire endeavor so why do it because this 
statement says without having to say, we do not believe what these guys believe. By saying, we have not found evidence within our galaxy, we think it's deeper, they are literally saying, we do not agree with Grush, we do not agree with Elizondo, we do not agree with any of these people, because it has not been proven by scientific method, and that's what we're all about. Because, dude, I'll tell you right now, SETI will lose funding so fucking fast if Tim Burchett gets involved. If Lou Elizondo gets involved, if Gary Nolan gets involved, if any of these people get involved, you watch as everybody else piles on them like they do with Elizondo and Grush, saying you have no basis for your claims. And when that happens, a scientific institute being called out for not having basis for their claims, loss of funding. And because already, of loss of credibility. Well, and they already lose said, credibility think about they align with them. Well, yeah, yeah and yeah. SETI already has not been, I mean, they haven't proven anything yet. So they're on thin ice already. The last thing they knew, need is Tim Burchett with his Bible-thumping rhetoric to ru run in there and be like, we're here to capture the demons. Good Lord. So, dude, you I'm cover, telling I hope you cover Burchett with oh, this fuckery. I am. Oh, I, I do. I'm going to go. Oh, man. Speaking of which, we need to move on with this because I want to get after Burchett hard. Okay. Uh, but uh, anyways, that's what I think this SETI thing is all about. On the surface, they're saying we haven't found anything. But I believe if you look deeper and read between the lines, they are making a very clear statement of saying we have not found scientifically what these people are claiming so we are not going to say that at all in fact we're going to say we're now moving outside the galaxy to literally remove themselves from everybody they're going that far they're literally going outside of the universe to get away from lou elizondo and david grush it's that Fuck, it's, that's quite a schism man and i can't I'm wait to see you. I can't wait to see Avi Loeb's response to this. I'm going to, well, I wonder yeah, how we'll he's going to spin this. We'll see. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. But along those same lines is you have this whole thing going on with, um, oops, with, uh, you know, the, the, the relabeling of, uh, of UFOs to UAPs. Obviously, it happened a while back. You have people that are coming out saying, oh, this has been going on since the 1940s. They've been doing it do it calling it uaps uh but they only did it behind closed doors and blah 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 blah. you know it's like okay whatever but you know i believe that what's happening this uh, again is another indicator of ufos what do you think of when you say ufos you think about all the old shit right something i called out bassett on is why is it you don't want to acknowledge corso why is it you don't want to acknowledge any of the old stuff? You want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about it. Dude, he flat out, I told him, I said, it's like you don't even want to talk about it. He's like, oh, I don't mind talking about it, even though he referenced Roswell multiple times, multiple times. Yet he would not, like, entertain the idea. In fact, when I talked about Corso, he went as far as to say that maybe Corso even exaggerated claims in Day After Roswell. So what I believe is I believe that what you have is you have these scientific institutes like SETI that are legitimately trying to find evidence, okay? And they're doing that with scientific evidence and, and method. And that's why they haven't found anything or made any claims to find anything. But yet you have all these people within government that are making these claims. So what you have now is you have the UAP cult, so this is straight up what it is, a UAP cult. Anybody who says UAP, talks about UAP, being UAP, and all that shit, you're a cult member. Anybody else who is willing to acknowledge that they are simply changing terminology to escape the stigma of the last 70 years having produced nothing, nothing. So what are they doing? They're completely removing history of UFOs and bringing in UA. So now UFO ufology starts now you watch as, Oh, ufology didn't start until Grush came forward. What are they all saying? Oh, we didn't make this much headway until Grush. Forget the fact that we had hearings back in the fifties. We had hearings in the sixties. Imagine that, but nobody wants to talk about that. 
And the same ideas, same concepts, same talking points, same evidence was brought up then. Like I said multiple times, David Grush is Philip Corso 2.0, period. And what they're trying to do, like the way they're trying to push Greer out, is they are getting rid of the old faces, bringing in new ones, because they need to erase the fact that the past 70 years has been a fucking fraud. A fraud. It's been a fraud. Period. Lies, deceits, fraud, all of it. And they can't deal with it. So what are they going to do? They're going to bury it. They're going to bury the last 70 years and they're going to start fresh in 2020 or whatever the fuck it was when Grush came It's forward. a rebrand. And look at this. Did you Absolutely. make this image? Did I you did. Make this? I did make this. It's brilliant. The day after Roswell is from Philip Corso. That's right. right? And That's then right. Underneath you have Imminent, That's which right. supposedly is the new reset. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's Bible. It's Lou Elizondo's it's, book. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. it's yeah, gospel it's now. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. all rebranding. That's all of it. All of it. That's that's what all this is. Is all rebranding. You're seeing it in action right now. They are realizing the brand is tanking. So what are they going to do? They're they're going to bring in the uh, uh, what what was the what was the person's name that was doing the spoke the the spokesperson for Bud Light? What was what was the name of that twat? Oh, Dylan Mulvaney. Mulvaney. Is that the, yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah. This is literally the Bud Light maneuver. <laughs> they are literally going, we hate our demographic. We hate our customers. They're stupid. They've ruined it with all their dumbass claims. We need more government officials now. We're going to wipe out. No more. We're never going to talk about uh, uh, um, the, uh, uh, I am completely drawing a blank here. The uh, original case, 1961, abduction, uh, Betty and Barney Hill. Thank you, Betty and Barney Hill. They are completely going to erase all of it. And and I'll tell you, the, the conversation with Bassett was the number one clue for this. The fact that he did not want to talk about anything. And even when I brought up the fact that it is the, the foundation of ufology, he went as far as to say, what do you mean? What the fuck do you mean? What do I mean? What the fuck do you mean? What do I mean? He knows what you mean, Absolutely Ben. Absolutely knows what I mean. You're on, you're on to it, man. It you, was you wild. Know. The fact that he goes, I don't know. What do you mean it's built on it? Uh, and I go, I literally said, um, that's where ufology started? What the fuck are you talking about? It was unreal, dude. So that's what I'm saying yeah, is yeah. all of this, the SETI thing, the NASA thing saying there's nothing, all of this going on, this government fracture, this is a massive thing that's going to happen where you're going to see an overwrite and you're going to see an attempt to completely ignore brush away every all the past 70 years because it is a blemish it is a blemish on the fact that nobody could prove this shit for 70 years so why would we give it another five years no they need that to go away and they need to say from grush forward here's what we found from grush forward, negating everything else that came, proving that nothing's been proven. That's the whole point of this. That's what I believe is the point of this. So that's what I think is going on with that. But now let's get on with Tim Burchett, the fucking stupid, stupid. Dang it. <laughs> dude, this guy is wild, man. Tim Burchett, dude. Mummy fever is what he's got. Mummy fever. So... <laughs> what is going on with this image did you make this of course i did look i took, <laughs> the, I took the head of the actual mummy and put it on a sexy mummy right because burchett's hard for his mummy right now and i couldn't have like the normal mummy because that'd be gross you know so yeah no he's <laughs> tim burchett's all about it <laughs> anyways <laughs> So yeah. here's what we have, okay? Now, look, I mean, I could tell you a whole bunch of this stuff, but guess what? Luckily for us, there's a fucking video. There's a fucking video of Burchett just slobbering this guy's fucking knob. Here we go. Here we go. I hope you're ready for some pornographic slobbering. We have done research in Peru on tridactyl creatures. Would you be interested in this topic? Absolutely, and I would also be interested. <laughs> okay, here's what I didn't realize. I didn't, re <laughs> I didn't realize that this was they were. 
<laughs> I love the fact that they actually, okay, so if you're not watching this, this is a video of the, whoever the guy is, the, the uh, Peruvian, Mexican, whatever scientist guy that came forward with the mummies, and Tim Burchett. What's really hilarious is there's a translator guy that's translating in English Tim Burchett's English. So they're literally dubbing over that. I got to play it now. That's even better. That's even better than listening to fucking fuck face Tim. In getting some people to analyze those bodies that were independent of the federal government. <laughs> you know what I love? I love the fact that they gave Tim Burchett a Hispanic accent. That is so funny. Yes, I would absolutely. Be there. I'd love to uh, go over the mummy. It's so funny, dude. If we could bring them to the U.S., what would we do? Would you be interested in getting involved in this? So let me ask you this. If in Mexico or Peru, wherever the fuck they've been doing this, if they have proven, as they have claimed, definitive proof that these mummies are alien, why, why, George, do you need to bring them to the U.S. to be verified? Why, if you've already proven it, George, George, why do you need to take it in front of Tim fucking Burchett and his people if you've already proven it? It's definitive proof, right? It's definitive proof, George. So why do we need Tim Burchett? Oh, and his independent, watch this, his independent people. Absolutely. I would help you to find someone to analyze them. That's very important to a lot of people, you know? So they haven't been analyzed? Tim Burchett's people are better than the people that are over in wherever the fuck they're doing this? What? Yes, sir. I will bring you many x-rays, tomographies, whatever you need to take them to any university, to any scientist you want to have your own. Why haven't they done that? Why do they need Tim Burchett to hand-deliver the mummy stuff to universities. Why do they need Hillbilly Burchett to deliver the materials to the universities? They can't do that themselves? Oh, Tim Burchett's got the handlers? What? Uh, I mean, it makes no sense. It makes no I sense. Mean, I mean, Musan has to fucking maximize his grift. Oh, of course. Over on this side of the fence. Oh, and, and Tim Burchett is all about the grift. Oh man, it, it's been it. proven. It's multiple like academics that That's have come into say. Mexico to disprove this. Fucking it's got shit. eggs, George. It's got eggs. Own results. This is a terrible and video. Maybe because terrible it is video. what it is, they will tell you they are real. And if they do, at that point, you can be absolutely certain that this case is real. So. We don't know that they're real? Is that what he's saying? So wait a minute. So wait a minute. So unless Tim Burchett and his independent team of hillbilly doctors are able to determine that the Nazca mummies or whatever the fucking mummies we're dealing with now are, then it's not real? It's not real? This video is very important because we now we the civil society of the world have these bodies. These bodies do not belong to any government or are not in the hands of the Peruvian government. We have seven bodies, humanoid bodies with three fingers, no ears, reptilian skin, horizontal fingerprints and so many details that tell us they are not human. Uh, vertical fingerprints that they didn't find without the help of a Colorado district attorney, by the way. Uh, so apparently Mexican doctors have got nothing on Colorado district attorneys. Good Lord, this video is terrible. Holy shit. Good God in heaven. Truth poll? Who the fuck, man? Jesus Christ, get your shit together. How am I supposed to use your content if it's like that? <laughs> Do you think Tim Burchett was, was fucking, like, forced to entertain this known scam artist with, with this questionable history? 
you know, as being a ufologist in Mexico. I mean, Jaime Musana, you know, he's been busted for for so many like hoaxes. And like, like, is is Tim Burchett being blackmailed to to fucking take on this huckster? I mean, why? I mean, even if he wasn't, I mean, wouldn't this like hurt Tim Burchett's like pro- political standing and everything that he's trying to do with disclosure? Once they do find out definitively from a U- United States that hey, these things are fucking forgeries. It's going to be egg on his face, dude. Like, they're not going to determine that. You can, look, everybody involved in this, from Birdchat to that that big lip bitch, uh, the the congresswoman or the fuck her name is. Oh, Anna Paulina Luna. Sure. Uh, so yeah. look, I, all these people are captured attention whores. Who the fuck had heard of Tim Birdchat before this? Who the fuck had heard of Luna, whatever the fuck her name is? Who had heard of that pencil neck dick guy that's also involved in it? A Rubio or whatever the fuck. You know, dude, nobody heard of any of these fucking people until they got involved in this. They are political failures who the only reason they have attention is for getting involved in this. Tim Burchett is so fucking stupid that he can't see that these are not real, you know? And I look, I know people who believe that these aliens are real. So I don't want to go as far as to say that everyone who believes these aliens or these mummies are real is stupid. But, I mean, come on, you know? Like, can you not see at least the potential, the, the high, high likelihood that it is fucking fuckery. I mean, this is like, it is, to me, it is just like so, so bad. It's so bad. And like, one of them, one of them has eggs, Ben. Dude, of course it has eggs and vertical fingerprints. That's all we need to know. I mean, look, all we need now is for Tim Bed to come over and put his gray floppy dick into the, uh, the ass of the mummy and get some monkey pox. And then we'll for sure be certain that this thing is real and we can treat them both with vaccines and we can get on with our lives. You know what I mean? It's fucking stupid, dude. I'm so tired of talking about the fucking mummies. I'm so done with it. It's so fucking stupid. But Tim fucking Burchad has got to get his fucking dick wet. So so here he is with he Amy, whatever the fuck, uh, to try and get the mummy shit. It is so fucking gay. It's just so stupid, dude. It, I'm over it. I'm fucking over it. Let's thank some people. I believe I see militia forming. Tinfoil. Militia. Stop, militia. The tinfoil militia. I joined the militia, but why would you? What do you think tap water is? It's a gay bomb, baby. Oh, hey, we want you to get involved in uh, our very... Where'd he go? There he is. We want you to get involved in the show. Uh, You know, buy some merch, send us some money. It really does help. You know, uh, like, share, subscribe, all that good jazz. Just get involved. Join the chat. You know, we got a number of great people that join us in chat every show. It's very, very nice. Um, it's, It's been great. The support has been wonderful. But, you know, first... I have a very important uh, uh, announcement to make uh, for for our top donor. Top donor. There's there's no mincing words. This guy is our top donor. Period. And uh, we're talking about um, Torsten Grotique. And Torsten, I ha- I hope you're watching because I have a special little presentation for you, sir, uh, that we're gonna go over right now uh, because I appreciate you. And um, it's been a road. It's been a year. But let's get into this, huh? Shall we? Here we go, buddy. Torsten Grotik. You, dude. You are the man. And also, a.k.a. Thor. A.k.a. Uh, Bugs Rogers. A.k.a. Uh, he goes by a number of names. But he has officially become an admiral. In the tin foil militia, the first admiral of the tin foil militia, of course, is Torsten Grotik with a whopping thousand dollars that it took to build this road. It took him a year, but he made it. Here he is. Love you, dude. Welcome to be an admiral, brother. Love you, man. 
Love you. I love the support. I love you. It's a true honor to have you in the Tin Foy Militia, man. You have made this podcast great. You will continue to make it great. And we will continue to be great. Love you, dude. Let's continue it on, shall we? Let's thank some more people. Fuck yeah, brother. What a, what a guy, dude. A thousand bucks. A thousand bucks. Let me just give you a little history here of, of Mr. Uh, Torsten Grotique, shall we? Um, this guy started way back in October of last year, um, 2023. October 16th, I believe it was, uh, is when he got started with one single... $5 donation. One single $5 donation got this whole train a rolling. And from there, his momentum has continued on. I mean, continued on this guy. So yeah, October 16th with a single five bucks and a simple note, simple note that said three. And eventually he ended up, you know, providing us with a whole bunch of notes, a whole bunch of great knowledge. He's probably one of the one of the top chatters in our Discord server. He has created a whole bunch of different threads and various servers are on his own. Uh, we promoted him into the Space Command, which gives him a little bit of control over these things, and he's really helped branch it out. I mean, this guy, dude, this guy, love you, man, love you, truly, 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 and. Um, and he gives us another, another donation today. Ten bucks from, again, the wonderful Bug Rogers, a.k.a. Thor. Um, and his note says, why would alien intelligences possibly be interested in humans? Number two, because, uh, again, the first reason I can't remember what the first reason was, damn it. I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was uh, humans good looks. I don't remember. Uh, but number two, he says, is humor. There may be an unlimited number of intelligent life forms in the universe, but how many of them would develop humor? Look how beneficial humor is in both an individual's life and in society as a whole. Alien sociologists would be crazy not to look into it, wouldn't they? And he says, join our Discord. We got memes. Indeed, we do. Indeed, we do, sir. Thank you so much. And we got a bunch of people. We have a whole bunch of people in the Tinfoil Militia, not just Thor, uh, Thor. I bet he is, a again, Admiral, a leader. Le a man amongst men! But uh, we got multiple guys. We got Casey Armadillo. We got Carlton Turtle. We got Michael Benavides. We got Matthew Morfitt. We got my good friend, Ed. We got my good friend, Nate. We got, uh, we got his girlfriend, Morgan. We got a whole bunch of people that contribute to the podcast every single month with their sustained donation on Patreon. And uh, while they may be silent, they are still incredibly helpful. So we love you all. We thank you all. Uh, but we encourage all of those who are not donors, who are not contributors, who are not involved just yet, get involved. Go to ufonopodcast.net. See all the ways that you can get involved. Time, talent, or treasure. Times is, could be as simple as some comments in the video after it posts. Could be getting involved in in the chat could be a number of things that simply take a minute or two and help spread the word or whatever. But talent is something on the back end that helps us actually grow the show, whether it's clips, whether it's merch, whatever it is. Our great friend Carlton, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Casey Armadillo uh, did some merch for us. It's beautiful. He does a fantastic job. Love it. So he does time, talent, and treasure. And of course, treasure is exactly what we've been talking about. Torsten Grotique's amazing generosity turned into a number and thrown back our way. That's value for value, baby. And that's what we want. Value for value. And uh, we, again, we thank everybody in the Tinfoil Militia. Go get involved in our uh, in our Discord community. It's awesome. Hopping. It's, uh, there's people always in there. I can't, I can't even keep up. I got so much shit going on right now in my personal life, I can barely keep up with all the conversations in Discord. But it is beautiful. Beautiful. Truly. Truly. It means the world to me to see people um, just like-minded or otherwise getting together and having conversations respectfully and sharing ideas no hate just all just storm brainstorming creative juices spurting every skeet 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 baby we love it so anyways thank you all and uh, again join the discord community get online ufnopodcast.net where you can find everything watch listen merch all in one place 
great, great place to go to see everything UFO know. Catch new episodes every single Sunday. And, of course, buy some merch. Get involved. Be an official tinfoilist like our newest admiral, Torsten Grotik. And uh, in the Tinfoil Militia, become a member. Join today. And, of course, stay elevated. Keep your eyes in the skies and watch out for the government. My good friend George here knows they're shysty bastards. Peace out, y'all. Bye-bye. 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 Bye